Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a, uh, won't be a long meeting today. Um, so I think let us just dive right into it. Um, and may I welcome the AG, the AG team that's here. Uh, and, uh, we'll take it from here. Um, so I, I think let's just uh, take the presentation um, one at a time and we'll pose questions at the end of each presentation as not to cloud the uh, uh, issues. So AG, can I hand over to you? Uh, and then colleagues, uh, we will proceed in that fashion. We'll take the three presentations one at a time. And then, Sister um, uh, uh, Mbipu, then please enter the apologies into the record uh, as, as per usual. So colleagues, welcome and uh, good morning. Let's dive right into it. All right. Um, thank you so much, Honorable Chairperson. Good morning, good morning to the Honorable Members of the Committee. Um, Chairperson, um, again, as an introduction, my name is Khabuko Mape. I'm the business executive responsible for the labor portfolio. Um, so today we'll bring to you the compensation fund. The UIF will also bring to you the NSF. My colleague, Zoli Swa, um, she's also be joining us, Zoli Zazwakala. She will join us for the CETA presentation right at the end. Um, without any further ado, I wanted to allow uh, Ms. Michelle Magerman, um, the Deputy Business Executive, to take us through the Compensation Fund, Chairperson. Following your direction, we'll then take the comments and the reactions of the committee before we move over to the UIF. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Okay. All right. No, that's fine. We can proceed in that question. Colleagues, I just want to bring our attention to the fact that um, I think it's the Compensation Fund and the UF that have not tabled as well. Um, so they are in our reports. So we get this against that backdrop as well. And that they've not taken. But let's hand over then to the deputy business, uh, business exec, and then we will um, get, take questions at the end. Ma'am, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Chairperson, and good morning, good morning to honorable uh, members. Um, I'll take you through the compensation fund. Um, unfortunately, I can't share my screen. Um, we have shared the document. If I can just... You can share. Okay. Okay. She will, oh, okay. thank you so yeah. much. I see now. Thank you. I've been given permission. Thank you so much. Um, I'll take you through the compensation fund. Um, I do have the presentation for the for the, the current year outcomes, but I've also um, included some history and some background so that the members can also appreciate um, how far um, the, the, the outcomes have come and, and the movement thereof. Um, I'm going to move to um, the page um, the, the, the page on the overview of the fund. Um, if you look at uh, this page, uh, we have looked at the different areas, the key areas of the compensation fund, which is made up of employer contributions, uh, the medical services where they pay medical service providers, um, or they assist with, with medical services to, to claimants, as well as paying out pensions, as well as benefits. And we also look at the investments that the compensation fund makes um, in, in various areas, um, in various institutions uh, via the, the PAC. I've included the mandate or the key areas of the compensation fund as they've articulated it in their own um, uh, documents, in their own strategy documents. Uh, which is to, to, uh, to compensate for occupational injuries, uh, diseases by workers, or death through injuries in the workplace. In terms of the funding, um, the, the compensation fund does get funding from uh, employers when they pay their levies, uh, and these are fixed rates that should be included, uh, that, that are out calculated and are directed by the COIDA Act. Honorable members, if you look at page five, um, as I have screened here, um, the audit opinion history of the compensation fund, you'll see that it is a disclaimer. It's been disclaimed uh, uh, for the last five years, and I'll show you the history also on the next uh, coming uh, uh, slides. A disclaimer meaning that in, in most instances, we could not obtain sufficient evidence of the amounts that are disclosed in the financial statements of the fund. If you look at this page on page six, you'll see there where I've ticked all the areas in the financial statements where we have got qualifications which are resulting in the disclaimer 
um, in the disclaimer opinion. If you look at the area here, what I've included here, um, honorable members, is a, a just a paragraph to show that this has been continuing for the past 10 years, uh, with the exception of 2011 and 2012, which we, where we have they had received an adverse opinion, um, which is also an opinion which says that various areas in the financial statements, we could not agree with the support that they've provided to us with, the, with what is recorded in the financial statements. Uh, but for the past eight years, they have received a, um, a disclaimer opinion. And if you look at this, um, this area shows you which areas in the financial statements received these, um, these uh, disclaimer opinions um, and how many years that this has been continuing for. And you'll see that in this wheel, it covers quite a various number of items in the financial statements. In terms of the... Um, in terms of the challenges that we've, um, in terms of the challenges that we've uh, uh, looked at over the past years and the findings that we've raised, if you look at this uh, on page, on page eight, I have summarized areas in the different uh, key uh, key business areas in terms of what are the kind of findings that we've identified over the years. Um, and these are still continuing even in the current year. So if you look at the employer contributions, in the main, we're saying here that the revenue schedule that is provided does not agree to what is uh, recorded in the financial statements. And there are various areas of challenges and, and, and findings that we had identified. So if you look at the employer contributions, we're saying that there is a backlog in processing the return of earnings of the employers. Uh, which impacts your um, your number that you are included in your revenue amount, so the completeness and accuracy of revenue that you are disclosing, because you have not uh, processed all the the return of earnings of your employ in, of your employer, so your revenue could be um, understated. Uh, not all employers are also registered uh, on the the compensation fund, um, and the COIDA Act is therefore also not enforced for employers that are not registered. In terms of medical services, we identified so, uh, some areas here where duplicate payments were made to service providers, uh, uh, claims were paid with incorrect statuses, uh, uh, where the, there was um, change of banking details within the system, there was fraudulent processing of some of the claims that were made, and in the system itself, we found various um, areas in terms of segregation of duties. For example, if somebody puts through a claim, there should be somebody that approves the claim. There should be somebody that releases the claim. And the, the system does not necessarily ha have that, uh, those controls built in within the, within the system to, so that um, there is that uh, level of controls that should be in place. In terms of the pensions as well, we found similar um, similar uh, findings as in the medical services, um, where there was no controls also within the system, uh, and various um, uh, payments within uh, made without the uh, appropriate authorization. In terms of the investments uh, that the fund makes in various uh, entities, uh, we did find that there is a lack of monitoring. Uh, um, of the of the of the investments uh, through the very uh, with the with the entities that uh, um, with the entities that the fund invests in, and that is the, the this uh, you'll see that it has been uh, ongoing uh, throughout the, the the ten years or throughout even the five years. Uh, no movement has uh, been made uh, uh, significantly in the fund to to um, to overcome some of these challenges that we've been expressing. In terms of the areas of qualification as expressed in the financial statements, in, in the current year financial statements, uh, I will go through all of them then um, in a little bit more, more detail. In terms of revenue and receivables, which is the, the employer contributions, the revenue and receivables, um, the fund, we're saying here that the fund did not have the controls in place uh, to, uh, uh, for the completeness and accuracy of employer contributions, as some of the rate of returns were not assessed, and also some of the employers are not complying with the act, and this is not enforced, and not all employers are registered and assessed by the fund. 
In terms of benefit, this is when a, a, a person comes in and claims uh, in the fund. We're saying that we could not get an appropriate uh, uh, listing of, of the claims that have been given to the fund um, to support the amount that is recorded in the financial statements. This has led to various areas um, in the financial statement. So it will uh, your benefit, your claims paid uh, uh, figure in the financial statements will be misstated in terms of this. It will also affect your liability uh, because then the fund needs to say, uh, looking at the claims that are coming through, what is our future liability going to be? Uh, so if this listing is not complete and accurate um, and speaks to what is recorded in the financial statements, you won't be able to disclose that liability because you won't be able to, uh, to, to calculate it appropriately. In terms of payables from non-exchange, here um, what is in here is mainly that there were uh, debtors, so people owing the fund uh, that have credit balances. So either they've overpaid or, or for some reason um, their account is sitting with a the credit. Um, these we could not verify to say were these overpayments, what are these credit balances made up of? The supporting documentation could therefore not be provided. In terms of investments, the fund has a, quite a number of investments in associates. So where they own a, a, a share of, for instance, if you own a bit of 20% of the, of, the, of, the, of the shares of that entity, or you have some kind of rights in terms of voting. So some kind of control, uh, they have those investments. They also have subsidiaries where they own quite a bigger chunk. So they own uh, about 50% of the majority of the shares or they have a, a controlling interest. We found that these investments are not, we, they're not receiving information from the investees to be able to in, disclose in the financial statements the value of these investments. Um, so they're not getting uh, maybe the financial statements or the management accounts from those uh, investees. So that they can also say that I've invested this amount in this company. Therefore, my investment now is grown or it's decreased. And this is the value that should be disclosed in the financial statements uh, um, to show um, the value that we, we've, we've received from investing. In terms of prior period errors, so in the in the fund, they they've uh, tried to to correct figures in the prior year. Uh, so you'll see in the financial statements, there's quite a, a number of areas where they they've uh, uh, attempted to correct uh, prior year's amounts. Um, however, we could not get the supporting evidence to show that if you are adjusting a prior amount for a hundred thousand, what substantiates um, that adjustment. And therefore, we could not conclude that, that this is this uh, prior this errors that were corrected are indeed um, supposed to be corrected, and is those the, are those the correct amounts that should be corrected? In terms of contingencies, um, this is where um, uh, the fund is required to, to disclose any um, liabilities that might occur from, for example, summonses or um, or some court cases. Uh, there was inappropriate evidence to substantiate um, some of the amounts that um, are disclosed in the financial statements, and some of the records were not were not there. As well as where they have securities, um, where they've ceded some of the, the where they've ceded for some of the entities, um, these amounts could not they, they could not disclose these contingencies. In terms of irregular. And and fruitless and wasteful expenditure that is disclosed in the financial statements. Um, in some instances, we could not get the supporting evidence uh, to support the amounts, the irregular expenditure and fruitless and wasteful that is disclosed. And also, we could not say that the, the amount disclosed is complete uh, within the fund uh, that is disclosed for irregular and fruitless and wasteful. In terms of the audit of predetermined objectives, um, if you look at the history, uh, you'll see that we have uh, reported uh, 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 quite um, for a number of years on, on the predetermined objectives. Um, and you'll see that in the audit report, we have reported on the program three in terms of medical benefits, saying that there is a lack of supporting documentation on what is reported in, um, in the medical benefits. And this speaks uh, also to the qualification paragraphs we've raised on the financial statements that the, the reporting on 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 um, uh, on the listings that are provided and the information that supports what is sitting in the 
and the annual uh, performance report is not uh, supported. In terms of compliance with, uh, with laws and regulations, we have reported that the annual financial statements were not prepared in accordance with the, um, with the, the PFMA. Uh, so it was not complete and accurate as, as is required as of the material, uh, the material misstatements identified and also then resulting in the disclaimer um, opinion. In terms of expenditure management, here we have reported the non-compliance with the, the PFMA in terms of preventing irregular expenditure, um, as well as the uh, fruitless and wasteful expenditure, the non-compliance with the PFMA there and also that the resources were not utilized economically, resulting in these uh, fruitless and wasteful expenditures that you see disclosed. In terms of consequence management, the fund has various number of uh, cases, and you'll see later on when I present, there are quite a number of cases that are still uh, ongoing. Um, therefore, consequence management is not taking place uh, timelessly. It's not dealing with uh, transgress transgressors of the, the non-compliances swiftly enough uh, so that um, um, these consequences are taken. Money is recovered where it needs to be recovered um, and dis disciplinary steps are taken when necessary. If you look at uh, the irregular expenditure that I'm um, on page uh, 10 at, at, uh, at the bottom and on page 11, I'm gonna go through irregular expenditure as well as fruitless and wasteful expenditure. If you look, um, we do have a, I do have a disclaimer there that says that, uh, just recall that the amounts that are disclosed, we have qualified on them uh, because we cannot confirm the full extent of the, the, the irregular expenditure or the fruitless and wasteful expenditure. If you look at the amount incurred in the current year, it is about 11, um, 11 million. And this one where we identified a contract that was exceeding uh, the, the requirement that uh, where a contract is extended or the amount paid or it's very, there's a variation on the contract, it shouldn't exceed the, the 15 million threshold. If it does, it needs to get the necessary approval from National Treasury. There was also a, a an award that was made where uh, the when you're looking at the the criteria uh, when they were scoring it, uh, local production and content was not um, was not uh, was not looked at, and that makes up the irregular expenditure in the current year. The fruitless and wasteful expenditure, uh, we also had the qualification there. Um, the one that we've identified is the twenty. There's a twenty six million. Um, that mainly relates to interest that was uh, charged and garnish orders that were charged. So, for example, when the service providers, a medical service provider gives an invoice, um, this should be assessed timelessly and the medical service provider should be paid. Otherwise, you do get charged interest. In some instances, uh, the court does uh, 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 um, tell the fund that you need to pay a certain um, amount within a certain lim limit of time. Um, however, if this is not done, then um, interest is charged. Um, therefore, um, this will result then in, in fruitless and wasteful expenditure uh, because the fund would then have taken uh, too much time um, and, and the service provider will then charge you uh, rightfully so the interest um, if you don't pay them in, in the agreed timelines. If you, look for, if you look at the investigations that are ongoing, there are quite a number of investigations. Um, the report that we, the registers we, we were provided, uh, as we total them up, they come to about 487 cases that are under investigation. Um, the, some of them relate to non-compliances, and there are some that there's about 71 that relate to fraud. Um, in, the, in, the year, in the beginning of the year, it was 126, uh, which related to fraud. Um, some of them were completed, um, and, and some of them, uh, seven of them related in some uh, in losses that were confirmed. Um, 26 were, uh, co were co closed by the, the fund to say that the allegations were unfounded and 71 uh, are still not yet finalized and they've referred nine to uh, law enforcement agencies. Uh, so these are the investigations that um, have been ongoing for quite a number of years. If you look at the, the last one, we are saying that these ones are actually taking uh, way over the six months um, a period to, to be completed. 
If you look at the drivers of internal control, so we're saying what went wrong within the fund or what is going wrong within, within the fund uh, that needs to be looked at. Uh, we've got in terms of leadership, we, we have quite a few reds as well as financial and performance management. At the bottom here, I've highlighted the key, the key ones where we're saying that these should be um, focused on. And here we're talking about leadership of the fund to ensure that consequence management is timelessly implemented. Um, and also there's no effective process to address poor performance of the fund. Um, and the compensation fund has, a, has uh, encountered a number of challenges in a number of years um, uh, with, with, um, with employees not necessarily operating at the highest level of excellence. Um, and this needs to be attended to. Financial and performance management we, we're talking here about the preparation of financial statements where we're saying that there is not reliable supporting evidence and inadequate reviews, uh, regular reconciliations, making sure that the financial statements are supported by schedules, they are supported by uh, reconciliations, um, and there must be adequate reviews of the consolidated and the separate financial statements before submission for audit. And in terms of the governance, we say that recommendations of internal audit and the audit committee are not adequately implemented. And therefore it makes these uh, functions not to be as effective as they, as they should be. Um, and, and this should, needs, to be, um, uh, needs to be attended to by the employees, um, as well as the risk management process. This should be, uh, should be timelessly completed to identify the risks that impact the fund and, and then actions then being able to be developed. In terms of recommendations that we have given to the fund, um, um, the fund management and the leadership of the fund, we, we, did, we do say that there is an urgent need uh, for a review of the control environment of the fund, including the role of management and subsequently strengthening the preventative and monitoring controls to identify deficiencies early and react appropriately. There should be a discipline in showing that accurate and complete financial performance rec records are maintained there should be a responsive action plan that must be implemented and continuously monitored for effective and, and enabled timely response to the material deficiencies identified and consequence management must be implemented and monitored employees who have transgressed and, and also resulted in some of the fruitless and wasteful and irregular expenditure and other misconduct that was identified. And also the leadership of the fund must instill a culture of accountability and a tone that will ensure that internal controls are adhered to. Recommendations for the committee. Here we're saying that the committee of the fund must ensure the timely finalization of the consequence in order for consequence management to appropriately be implemented. And then also monitor the implementation of resolutions taken by the committee to ensure that implementation is done timely. Um, BE, that is all from my side, Honorable uh, Chairperson. Um, that is the outcomes for the, um, for the compensation fund. Thank you so much. Um, th thank you so much, um, Michelle. I think, Chairperson, in summary, the, the message we are putting through on the compensation fund is that the entity has been stagnated. It's been 10 years. Um, for the compensation fund continuously not able to provide the financial statements that are transparent and reliable. And of that 10 years, we are saying 80 years of it was literally the auditors not given supporting documentation that will enable us to express our view. And that makes everything else a bit difficult because even if we get to the element of um, consequence management and everything else that follow, the absence of the supporting documentation makes it impossible for us to say who's not doing exactly what. And that is a message that we've been having with the fund. In the document, we also did um, some sort of a wheel for the committee so that you are able to see how many of these findings cut across right from the 2010 era um, up until this point in time. We had these conversations with the compensation fund. We had expressed our concerns we had indicated even to the leadership at department level that the compensation fund not only requires support, but require agent intervention. It just would not make sense that in the entity, we would have built a culture of not driving excellence, of people transgressing on the responsibilities trusted on them 
without the relevant consequence uh, playing themselves out. It's on that basis that, again, the AGSA decided that we are not able to express an opinion on the compensation fund, and hence we've given them a disclaimer. We believe that what we are asking out of the compensation fund is doable. We don't believe that is anything extraordinary. It is the basics of what PFMA is asking. Um, and therefore, we are expecting management and the leadership of the fund to do that which is um, asked by the PFMA. It's in summary what we are bringing to the committee at this point in time for the committee to, to support us accordingly. Thanks, Chairperson. All right, thank you very much, uh, AG. I think, colleagues, the grim picture that has been uh, painted uh, it simply confirms uh, our worst held uh, fears about the compensation fund uh, and is a confirmation uh, of the, the, the extent of the rot. And I think the concluding remarks by uh, AG uh, are, are indicative. Uh, of the, the the challenge, so colleagues, let's let me hand over to you. Um, if there are uh, any questions, Chairperson, at Honourable Dex. Hey, good morning, Chair. How are you? And good morning. I'm fine, and good then, how are you? Great. And good morning to all honourable members, and good morning to the AG. Uh, yeah, I want to appreciate the report of the AG. I don't think there's much we can, there's anything really we can ask the AG because the report of the AG is very, very, very clear uh, on, on what has happened. And uh, we need to, as Peggy said, we need to call the right, the right Jesus to deal with this matter. Uh, I just want to say, Che, you know, I've listened to this report. I've been listening carefully about the, to the AG when I've read this report last night. Listen carefully to the AG about uh, uh, the picture that's been painted. It's not grim, chair. You say it's a very, very grim picture. It's not grim, chair. If there was anything uh, worse than a, a, a disclaimer, if there was such a thing as something worse than a disclaimer, this report, this was definitely going to 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 qualify for that category. It's horrible. It's horrible to, for what is taking place there. And uh, we need to call people to come and account. They need to account because there's absolutely no systems in place. There's absolutely nothing, 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 nothing. I even think, you know, I don't know, there's absolutely nothing. Uh, and I understand very well why the AG is, is actually um, uh, uh, making, giving this, uh, giving the, the, this claimer. Uh, it's very, very fully understood and appreciate, uh, appreciated. And I think we must support the AG, uh, and we must support the recommendations of the, of the AG on this on this report. Thank you, Chairperson. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Dex, Honorable List, and then Honorable Mente. Um Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mervyn really has painted the picture quite quite clearly, and so have you. Um, it, it is horrible. But the, the, the really concerning thing here, Mr. Chairman, is that it's, it's been 10 years, and yet there's no sign of improvement. And, and one wonders how many of the accounting officers, and I assume there's been more than one over that 10-year period, because the the changes that take place so frequently at high level in these departments and entities is frightening. How many of them have actually landed up in jail? None, because there's, there's talk of fraud, there's all sorts of things. It's not just the individuals who, who, um, who must be held accountable. The accounting officer should at least have, have faced criminal charges um, by now, and it hasn't, and so, Mr. Chairman, I agree with Merv, and there's very little we can. I, Scopa is like the, 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 the last resort for the AG, I, in, in, and, and we have a huge responsibility, and I know we have taken that responsibility seriously, not just in this parliament, but even in the previous parliament, but we actually now need to find a way of, of ensuring that not only are people held accountable and land up in jail if we can, um, but actually that the situation changes. Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure how many of you actually try and access 
the Compensation Commissioner's um, website. Um, I do because I have employees um, and, and I follow the law and I pay what needs to be paid. But for some three years, I could not access it. We tried going to the local labor office to pay manually. Um, it's just a complete shambles and is, 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 is outrageous. Um, this is not your, your corner cafe. This is a major entity of government in this country that millions of South Africans depend upon. And yet it is like this. So Mr. Chairman, in the end, what I'm saying after a lot of talking, I'm afraid today, is that we now hold a huge responsibility given that the other um, persons and, and, and portfolio committees don't seem to be able to pull this thing right. Um, we need to now uh, pull a rabbit out of a hat here somehow and get this right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Honorable Lise, uh, Honorable Mente, Honorable Somio, and Honorable Tulasha. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Now, Chairperson, I. I just want to ask a question for to the AG. Where, where does it stop? How, how do they get uh, people who have not been presenting evidence and documentation of anything? This uh, particular report shows five years. It goes further than that. But when does it stop? At what point do they say no? We will not audit you until you produce this and that and that and that and take actions. So taking actions also include what uh, Honorable Liz just mentioned earlier, that what, what, what is it that they have reported to the portfolio committee in respect with this matter, not just the outcomes, but the absence of documentation, like the, it's non-existent. There's, there's absolutely nothing to prove that there is any document which backs the expenditure of the compensation fund. For all we know, money is spent, but if how spent, no one knows, no one is held liable. But my, my, my confusion is at what point does the AG say no until you this one gets involved, that one gets involved, police arrest you, this one does this. I want to just understand, and as well as uh, in the standing committee of the Auditor General, were these kind of instances reported to the, uh, to the standing committee of Auditor General? If so, what has been the response? Because I'm also a member of the Auditor General Standing Committee, but these kinds of instances, I do not remember us receiving a list of, these are the people who are just blatantly refusing work with us. And this is a point where we understand as AG, you can't just go in year in, year out, but the same people are not proving to be uh, doing anything in terms of the law, they are not uh, abiding by any constitution, by any audit re regulation, by any uh, financial regulations of the country. They are just doing their own thing. But we keep on producing a disclaimer. There should be a point where this stops. It can't be. And what, what then do you do when you are faced with this kind of a situation? Because from the SCOPA side, we're dealing with rents and cents. Yes, we'll get involved like uh, Honorable Liz is saying, but it's not enough because it's deeper than the rents and cents. It goes to service delivery itself. It goes to everything else that they are responsible for. So do they even reach their KPAs? Do they achieve anything? What's happening in, when, when these people are not doing absolutely anything but just spending money? Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you, Honorable Mentor. Uh, Honorable. Thank, thank you, Chair, and um, uh, good morning to all of your colleagues, uh, the Office of the AG. Um, in, indeed, indeed, the 
a report as it stands uh, is indicative uh, of something beyond uh, the, the the stated declaration by the uh, Auditor General. All red uh, it tells you that there's a bigger problem. <clears throat> but my question uh, is narrowed down uh, to uh, the closing remark uh, made by the uh, executive. Um, but, but mainly with reference to uh, what they um, uh, have advised the department uh, to. I think she uh, she put it starkly that um, there is a need for urgent intervention. Is that prescribed? Uh, what are the uh, key areas of prescription in terms of uh, that uh, urgent intervention? And what is the uh, department's response uh, on such a, a notable, uh, relevant, accurate advice. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. All right, thank you, Honorable Samio. Can you get the Honorable Tolasha? Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Good morning, Honorable Members in AG's office. Chair. In fearing of crucifying the wrong Jesus, I think I agree with uh, Honorable Becky for us to, I don't know how, Chair, we need to call the department and its committee to come before us so that we can take this blow by blow. Chair, this is devastating to say the least. I'm not sure what else do you want to say because the AGES office has explained everything to us. My worst frustration, Chair, is when the the in, when it comes to investigations, twenty six cases are closed, saying there's nothing to investigate further. I think we need to hear more, Chair, about this. This is a blatant abdication of the responsibility of of, his, of the of officials responsible for this. Chair, the other thing that I really would want us to suggest before is to say we're behind the AG's office. When whatever they want to do, we are behind them. They must do it with the necessary speed. Chair, for us who visited the center, the OIF center, and experienced what we saw there, then determine what will be the outcome of their report for 2021 22. We're still going to sit to in the situation they are in at the present moment. So Chair, I also would want to put a question to say, yes, I agree that the, the accounting officers must take responsibility, the MFMA and so on. I really want to hear more about the responsibility of the political head. I think we must be taken into confidence whether the president's tool to, 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 to to make sure that his ministers are performing, whether the area of the AG's report is covered in that tool. Because from where I'm sitting, Chairperson, we are in the second year of a sixth term, but already the AG's office is indicating to say, this situation has been there for the last five years, the least. And you are running for another five years. So it means we're waiting for 15 years. Forever, there are ministers that are coming in and out, and there's nothing that is being said to them or nothing that is being done to them. I think with the president committed to fight corruption and us being available to assist him and to play our role, let there be a response from his office to tell us so that we can be able at some point to put a question to the president on why is he keeping such ministers who are not really responsible in the spending of the taxpayers' money without any, you know, nobody cares. Why don't he then take over some of the departments and run it them himself? Because you can't have to pay the salary and the package to a minister when you know for a fact that this is what you are going to get 
even in the next financial year that is started in, I mean, the present financial year that is started on the 1st of April. So I want you to, to emphasize so that hey, we, we, we don't really bother the AG's office. In fact, instead we appreciate the work that they are doing. We now move forward with the powers vested in us to say, at least the PC must of, of, of labor must tell us. And we move on to say the president must give us more tools to say, what is he going to do in fighting corruption when this kind of, 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 of misdemeanors are happening? I mean, che, I, I, don't, I really would want, I'm, and I'm very strong in this, we need to, you need your office to create that space so that you are taken into, into confidence because we can't sit here forever and repeating the same things. Of course, they must come here that, that, that those officials must come here. The, our two wives must come here. At least the first one is here. We get now the information. Let the, UI, the, the, the SIU and, and tell us what are they going to do about this chair. This is possible, having been in Nelson Mandela, the metropolitan. It's possible because we saw a municipality that comes from this kind of a history that in fact is hard at work in trying to address all those problems. So if it is possible in a municipality, it is possible to a huge department. Unfortunately, this department, wrong people are being appointed for obvious reasons. Therefore, we must be seen doing something. So let them come here, let all the state institutions that deals with corruption, let them come here. In case here we get into what we experienced in the public works uh, uh, department yesterday. That was devastating. We can't get into that again. So let's really make sure that we use all the tools that we have that is going to make sure that this department really say we in, make them to understand who we, who we are and why are we here. We are here for taxpayers. We represent taxpayers. We can't smile and fold our arms when this mess is taking place. I appreciate the, the report, Chair, but I really want us to move forward. Uh, in a very radical way, Comrade Method, and make sure that we do something out of the information in addressing these challenges. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Tulashe. And the last one will be Honorable Swartz. Good morning, Chair. And, um, morning to everyone. Chair, mine are just two small ones. That if they could um, tell us how long the commissioner the CFO and the chief executive, um, audit executive have been with the fund. And also according to the extended mandate of the AG, what action is the AG going to take against the fund? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, I think uh, we are, th that was the last hand. Um, yeah, I think the AG gets the sense of the frustration of the members uh, in that we are saddled here with non-accountability over a period of 10 years. Uh, and the disclaimers which uh, have been reported uh, quite categorically, an indictment also on Parliament uh, and the situation which should not have happened persists. So I, 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 I think that the suggestions of members uh, in their entirety, we must carry them forward. Colleagues, as you have said, uh, and prioritize this because quite clearly uh, uh, there has been a shortcoming. So uh, AG, let me hand over to you uh, and then we will go to the next presentation uh, yeah. uh, across the value chain of Um, thank you, Chairperson. Let, let me really appreciate the comments from, from the honorable members. I think the comments made by Honorable Lise, um, the comments made by Honorable Trollage. Um, and I think I'm just going to try and, and answer the questions from Honorable Mentor, Honorable Somio, and Honorable Swat. Um, let me start with the one from Honorable uh, Mentor in terms of where does this, it stop, actually? At what point will we as the AGSA um, also indicate that we shouldn't be continuing? 
if you look at the audit report for the compensation fund, um, and if, if they are yet to table it, you would see that we put a paragraph there as a HSA. We said, if it wasn't for the legislation of South Africa that drives the compulsory audit by the HSA, we would have withdrawn from the audit of the compensation fund. And there lies the trick for us that from the legislation perspective, we are not allowed as the AGSA to walk away from any client, whatever the case may be. If you look at the international auditing standard, under normal circumstances, they will give an auditor an exit opportunity to say, should it be that you're not getting the reaction that you ought to be getting from the entity, you are allowed to excuse yourself. But from the auditor general, because of the legislation, and the legislated mandate, we, we can walk away. However, what we do, uh, what we did is we, we do engage all the relevant stakeholders. I think portfolio committee, we had conversation with them for the past, for as long as we've been doing the, um, the audits. So we did highlight um, some of the frustrations that we are having. And we've also been engaging the minister. I know we also had a session with the minister again yesterday, just concentrating on the compensation fund. And the, the key issue that we are having there is that with the non-submission of financial state of, of supporting documentation, it makes it very difficult for us even to get to the element of who's supposed to be held um, liable. But what we did with the amended act, the PAA, we had rolled them up. You would be clear, um, honorable members, that we were using the facing approach as the HSA. So we've taken compensation fund on board because it was in our interest that we try and use that part of the of the legislation to activate some of the consequence management to the extent that we can. And in doing so, as it stands right now, there are matters that we are still discussing with management that we issue through that we, we are planning to push them through, through that loop. The biggest challenge that we must acknowledge, however, from our side is that, like I, like I said, if, if it is a disclaimer, the absence of document, it makes it difficult even when you're pushing them through um, the material irregularity processes. But we had started with that process and we are hoping that the amendment will give us a bit of a mileage as opposed to before. So once we had um, some of the responses from some of the findings that we believe they are likely to be material irregularities, we, got, we are intending as an HSA to push the compensation fund at least through the, the amended Public Audit Act to see how much we can assist um, at least to the fund to act in certain cases that they need to act. In terms of um, reporting the matters to the Standing Committee on the Auditor General, I think I do take that comment that perhaps there is um, room for us to solicit support from that angle. I note your comment and your, um, and your indication, Honorable Mentor, in that regard. From Honorable Somio, you indicated, you are asking if this agent intervention is prescribed, and it is not, Honorable Somio, simply because of who the AG is and our mandate and responsibilities. So we don't prescribe to the minister or DG or commissioner what needs to happen. What we do tell them though is that something has to happen and it has to happen as in yesterday. And that's a message we put through even to the minister. In terms of how it comes through, we are also careful not to dictate what government would like to do for as long as there's an intervention that gives us mileage. We do say, however, that in instances where we have limitations, there's an opportunity to investigate those matters quick, not roll them up on a list of investigation, but pick all of those matters that may start to suggest fiduciary responsibilities that are not being discharged. And let's probe on them and see if there isn't an incentive for the chaotic environment that we could be operating under. So indirect, indirectly answering, answering your question, Honorable Muxomio, we do not prescribe as the ATSA. In terms of what is the, their response, um, we did get a commitment, I think at leadership level, um, at least this point, around, this point around that, this time around that they, they would act, they will come back to us and indicate exactly in what form and shape. So we are hoping that in the next communications that we'll be taking with the leadership, at least of the department, as the AGSA will be very clear on exactly how is the department um, intervening going forward to try and turn this thing around. And as they do so, we will also be working on our 
um, amended mandate as I indicated. And I think that question was also asked by Honorable Swart. I think that's what I was um, indicating. In terms of how long was the commissioner uh, there in particular, um, and and a couple of other seniors, including the chief audit executive, I'm gonna allow Michelle to answer it in particular. But we do know that the CFO that was there would have left. And I think the commissioner should be almost five years in that, in that space right now. Uh, if I could allow Michelle just to give us the exact period of how long was the, the commissioner and the chief audit executive were in the space. Um, other than that, um, I'll thank the members for the comments, available comments and suggestions. Um, thank you so much, Chairperson. Michelle? Sure. Um, thank you, PE. Um, the Commissioner, um, rightfully say, he's been there for now six years. Uh, the CFO is, there is a new CFO now, um, but the previous one was there for, for a year, three months. Um, and then the um, internal audit executive has been there for five years. Most of the executives have been there for uh, since about 2015. So they've been there for about six years uh, when they did the, the, the a turnaround strategy and they, they appointed. So those executives have been there for, for that long. Thank you. Thank you so much, B. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson. Um, right. Thank you, um, AG. Um, let us, colleagues, um, Conclude by on the the how to call on the compensation fund by saying we will look at the program and prioritize a, a hearing uh, on this uh, so that we can deal with the, the issues uh, in haste and of course we'll consult with the portfolio committee and I think mm -hmm. Mam raises a, an important question that uh, the presidency must give us a view. Uh, on this particular one, that in terms of the ministerial KPIs and so on, so let's 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 we we'll look at the program and we we'll make suggestions, uh, and then we we'll prioritize it uh, accordingly. May Chair I then ask Mam Zibula? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Chairperson, it's been more than eight years. No progress. We must we must request. I see, I see SIU to investigate. That is our only tool. Now, Chair, can you write a letter to SIU requesting, the, requesting them to investigate as soon as possible? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mam Zibola. All right, yeah. we will... Uh, we will put that as part of the roadmap moving forward in terms of how we, uh, we process it. The SIU, of course, will form part of the intervention. So I think we will take it forward. All right, colleagues, thanks. Can we get um, the next presentation from the AG? I think it's the UIF. AG, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Chairperson. Ms. Nana Sekwati um, will take us through the UIF. Nana, if you can start flighting the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, if I can just get an indication if my screen is visible. Not yet. Um, um, good morning, BA. I tried again. Uh, can I get an indication perhaps if my screen is now visible? Still not. Um, just share to all participants. Okay, we're getting there. That's it. 
All right, thank you so much. Um, good morning, Honorable Chairperson, and to the Honorable Committee members as well. Um, my name is Nana Sekwadi, and I'm the Senior Manager from the AGSA, responsible for the audit of the UIF. Um, Chair, I will be taking you through the audit outcomes of the Unemployment Insurance Fund for the 2019-20 regulatory audit. And as part of the report that we shared with the committee, the focus areas that we'll um, like to share is in terms of the audit opinion outcomes, mainly in the areas of financial statements, uh, predetermined objectives being your performance information, um, compliance, as well as the key uh, drivers of internal controls that contributed towards the audit outcomes um, of the UIF. And also we'll just have a key highlight in terms of the COVID-19 audits, as well as the key recommendations that we have shared both with the minister and the leadership in the department, as well as to that we share with the committee. Um, as part of the introductory, um, we do indicate that as the AGS essay, we do have a responsibility to assist the government governance uh, structures as well in enabling oversight and accountability and ensuring that we build public confidence. And this is uh, for that reason that we are with the committee today to share the outcomes based on the audit um, that was conducted so that we are able to give you the tools in order to enable oversight over these um, state entities. Um, the purpose of the document, like I indicated, will just share the audit outcomes for the 1920. Included in section 1.3 of the report, which is on page 3, we also just indicate some of the acts that are applicable to the UIF as a Schedule 3A entity in terms of the PFMA. And we also just indicate the mandate as well as the strategic objectives that are contained within the strategic plan of the entity, mainly being to um, provide support in terms of benefits for unemployment employment insurance benefits. If I then just go to page four of the report, um, section 1.4, we indicate the, the funding sources for the entity, mainly being the contributions that they receive through SARS and also from the contributions that they would have received from the uh, employers that are registered directly with the fund. Um, in total, for the 1920 financial year, the fund was able to um, collect almost 15, an estimated 15 billion worth of contributions uh, as compared to the 14 billion of the prior year. And those contributions are the ones that would, would, will then assist the fund in paying out the claims that they receive um, on a daily basis. So in section two at the bottom page of, uh, at the bottom of page four, we just indicate the audit outcomes over the past five financial years. You will note that there has been a stagnation in the audit outcomes between 2018-19 and 1920, as the fund continued to um, obtain a qualified audit opinion. And then, Jay, I'll take you to the bottom of page five, where we indicate the various qualification areas. And you will note, and I will just highlight or, in, or focus rather on the, fi uh, the outcomes on 1819 financial year and the 1920 financial year, which are the last two columns on your right, where you will see, and although the fund has, um, the audit outcome has remained um, the same, the number of qualification areas have increased. And I will just touch more in detail as I go further than the presentation. Predetermined objectives, again, we looked at program two, which is business operations. Um, you will see that between the financial year of 1819 and 1920, there's also been a regression in this area as the fund was qualified on this program. Compliance with laws and regulations, um, we, quali um, we qualified um, or rather we highlighted material instances of non-compliance in the areas of financial statements, expenditure management, and consequence management for 1920. So in terms of the overview on the financial statements, um, like I indicated in, in, in my earlier um, remarks that um, the audit outcome did not um, change. It is still uh, qualified. However, we still indicate as a key concern from the auditors that there has been no adequate policies and processes um, implemented within the fund to obtain information from um, these investees, um, which is the joint associates, where primarily the fund will then invest money as well and have a shareholding of less than 20%, and the joint ventures, which primarily would range between the, the, the ranges of 20% going to 50%. So, what we have experienced, and this limitation is similar to that which we had raised in the prior year as well, 
is that there are not adequate processes within the fund to, to be able to get the financial information that they need in order to ensure that when they do report on the performance of the fund, that um, that information that is provided to the users of the financial statements of the UIF can therefore be comfortable that the balances and the, the, the disclosure of those um, totals is accurate, complete, and, and can be reliable. One of the key um, recommendations that we made to the fund was ensuring that they strengthen the controls around um, financial management. Wow. Financial management has been an area that has been discussed and marked as a significant area of concern as there was a regression in that area in terms of the um, effectiveness of the financial management activities that are needed to be conducted at the fund. In relation to the qualification areas, Chair, I will take you through all the qualification areas. The first qualification areas, like indicators, is in relation to the investments where the fund does invest their money in these various um, um, companies. Um, and the first qualification uh, area refers to the fact that in the current year for the 1920 financial statements, um, the fund did indicate that it was not practical for the fund to obtain financial information that will ensure that they report um, in their financial statements. So meaning that um, they had indicated to us and in the financial statements that were submitted for audit, that it was not possible for them to account for these investments and be able to disclose how much these investments are worth as at the end of the financial year. And in that regard, we disagreed with the fund as the auditors, as we believe that the fund should be able to account for the how the investments are performing because that money is paid and is invested in these companies by the fund and therefore the monitoring thereof is very critical so that come the end of the financial year we are able then as a fund to assess whether there is a loss or a gain on those um, investments that we are making in these entities and hence that qualification paragraph that we have. The second element speaks to the limitation around the, um, the the financial information that they need in order to, to calculate the worth of these investments. So there, like I indicated earlier, there are not adequate processes within the fund to be followed that will ensure that come the end of the financial year, we are enforcing the, 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 the agreements that we have in order to get financial information that will allow us then as a fund to report um, accurately on, on the value of those investments. So we are not able then uh, the fund is not um, able to, to get that information because of the breakdown in the financial management activities that need to be strengthened within the fund. Furthermore, there are also the, the last two, and then if I go to the top page of page seven, these elements still also speak to the investments. Again, I spoke to how the information is supposed to assist the fund in therefore accounting for either the losses or the gains thereof. And it speaks again to the close monitoring that we are recommending needs to be strengthened within the fund and continuous monitoring for that matter to ensure that they're able to account for the investments at any point in time and not necessarily even at a year end when they need to then prepare the financial statements of the fund. The next area of qualification is on benefit payments and provisions. In this area, Chair, um, what we noted is that the fund in their financial statements, they did not disclose a, a they did not disclose or account for a large component of their outstanding claims, um, which mainly relate to those claims that would have been already reported to the fund, but have not yet been um, taken through the processes of approval, but uh, have been already reported to the fund. And those claims that are not yet known, but are estimated to be uh, submitted or received by the claim. So these were supposed to now uh, be accounted for as the li uh, pure liabilities of the uh, entity. And we noted that in the current financial year, this was not done by the fund. And Chair, maybe at this point, it would be also too important to highlight this and as contained in the report that the two first qualification paragraphs around the investments and the benefit payments and provisions were matters that were escalated to National Treasury based on our disagreements. And like you said, I think that we only managed to sign off on the 2019-20 um, audit report in the in on, on April the 13th because of the delays and the escalations that um, uh, the fund had had taken to to um, to the to report it to the National Treasury. With regards to contingencies, um, on contingencies, we also then noted it also relates to the um, claims. Um, we noted that um, the liabilities were the of the fund were incorrectly um, stated, and it is mainly as a result of the um, claims that are, are known to the fund or those that are expected to be received by the fund that were incorrectly disclosed as um, 
possible liabilities instead of an actual liability. So it is then uh, that the note that we also um, had a qualification in that area. And furthermore, that um, where they would indicate on some of the um, funds that they've set aside to, to, to pay for future claims, those were also incorrectly de um, disclosed in the financial statements as being uh, possible um, uh, future liabilities. Um, in terms of subsequent events, um, you will note that um, the, the, the fund did implement the COVID-19 case benefit during the um, financial year. Um, however, in the financial statements that were submitted for audit, we found that um, the fund had incorrectly disclosed the decision to pay the COVID-19 test benefit as being a decision that was taken after year end. However, this um, decision was taken um, before the 31st of March 2020, as issued by the Gazette um, through the Department of Employment and Labor on the 25th of March 2020. In terms of commitments, we also further noted that the, the commitments that were disclosed or the total of commitments that were disclosed in the financial statements of the fund um, was misstated. And this is as a result of the incorrect um, um, uh, balances being disclosed at year end, meaning that the contract values and the expenditures thereof did not reconcile to um, the balance that they should have disclosed in terms of what they still need to pay in terms of the contracts that they would have committed on. And this is as a result of, which speaks to what I spoke to earlier, the lack of financial, um, uh, con adequate financial management within the entity, because this is a schedule that is maintained and tracks, or rather track um, the, 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 the payments against the um, contracts that the fund would have um, committed to, so that we're able to then assess how much we still need to be paying in future in terms of these contracts that we have signed. And furthermore, there were other contracts that had been signed by the uh, by the, signed by the fund with other parties. However, the, these were not disclosed as part of um, the commitments that the fund still has as at the end of the financial year. Investment properties. We also noted that the uh, fund does have properties um, which they. They, they, they classify as investments um, where they, they do obtain um, their rentals from these properties. However, what we noted in the financial year is that um, when they needed to make an assessment in terms of how much that property is worth um, as at the financial year, uh, using valuations that they would have um, um, obtained from experts either to assess them in those valuations, those that are experts in property valuations, we noted that the fund only um, accounted or rather disclosed or valued those properties in the current financial year at values um, in relation to the prior year. So meaning the worth that is disclosed in the current year financial statement actually speaks to the, the value of the property as at the prior years and not necessarily what you and I would be able then to purchase from that property as of today or as at the 31st of March when the entity prepared the financial statements. If I go then to the next section um, that affects the um, audit report, it's on predetermined objectives. Um, the key program that we've uh, focused on was on program two, business operations. This is mainly in relation to the claims. Um, we did quite um, issue material findings in relation to this uh, area for 1920. And the reason around the, 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 the performance information um, having uh, material findings was because of inadequate review of the, um, the annual performance report itself, where we noted that the method of calculation used when me measuring the actual achievement did not actually accurately calculate the turnaround times. So mainly one of the key objectives of the fund is to measure the turnaround times in terms of when I receive a claim, how long does it then take us to process this claim and therefore um, make out the necessary payments to the beneficiaries? So based on that, um, we noted that when we go to the supporting evidence, being the, um, the claim forms themselves that are submitted by the beneficiaries, we noted that for the performance indicators that affect the unemployment um, benefit types, the in-service benefit types, being your maternity illness and adoption benefits, as well as for the death benefits being the, the, the deceased. Um, we noted that what um, the fund had reported as an achievement in their annual performance report does not correlate or does not agree to the underlying supporting evidence, meaning that in, in, in most instances, we found that it actually took a longer um, 
turnaround time and not that which is accounted for, not that it, which is reported in the performance report. And that is why um, we had material findings primarily on those three um, key um, indicators. The next, sec next section that affects the um, audit outcome, it's on compliance. We mainly had um, compliance findings on annual financial statements. One, we do highlight that the annual financial statements were not prepared in accordance with the prescribed uh, financial reporting framework. And this is um, mainly as a result of the qualification areas that I highlighted earlier in my presentation, as well as the lack of, of being supported by full and proper records. Again, it speaks to the limitations that I expressed when I was um, referring to the qualification areas. We do then in the second bullet highlight the material misstatements, which also again aligns to the qualification areas that I spoke to earlier. And the third element that affects the compliance under annual financial statements is in relation to um, the, the fact that the fund submitted the financial statements two months later after the, the legislated um, deadline as per the Gazette that was issued by the Minister of Finance. So we only received the set of financial statements for the UIF on the 30th of um, September, um, 2020. Expenditure management, expenditure management. Here we're referring to prepayments that were done um, before the services were rendered. So this is in relation to contracts which the entity has for the unemployment alleviation schemes where they will sign contracts with various service providers to uh, roll out some of the interventions um, that the um, fund will roll out in order to assist um, curbing or upskilling rather of the um, un uh, sector. So in this instance, what we found is that there were advanced payments that were made on the contracts um, before any deliverables were actually received by the fund. And hence that is the qualification, um, it's the instance of material non-compliance that we're highlighting. Consequence management, again, we had issues um, uh, identified in relation to consequence management, where we could not obtain sufficient appropriate ev audit evidence that there were disciplinary steps or there was take action taken against those officials who incurred irregular expenditure. And again, um, the second bullet speaks to the matter that we highlighted again in the previous year, where um, there were investigations that were conducted and there were recommendations that were put forth to the fund to implement in terms of taking appropriate disciplinary um, action. However, to date, um, those action or disciplinary actions have not yet been taken. And again, um, the last element speaks to strategic and planning management. Um, we noted that the fund did not submit the uh, fourth quarter performance report as required by the Act. Um, if I go then to section 2.1.2 on irregular expenditure, um, here we highlight the expenditure in the 1920, the fund, um, incurred irregular expenditure to, uh, estimated at 393 uh, million and the uh, irregular expenditure um, in the table below uh, is mainly in relation to um, the root cause rather is mainly in relation to um, the variations exceeding 15% which were not necessarily approved as well as an extension of a contract without the necessary approval from national treasury. So that, that is the irregular expenditure. And if you look at the prior year as well, you will see that um, the 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 the, the non-compliance in relation to the variations of fifteen percent and not being approved is a, a a a recurring root cause for the fund. And if I go to the investigations as well, um, on the top page of um, page eleven you will see that we still have um, investigations that are going on and some of the non-compliance in that um, regard as well is based on the fact that the 15% um, variance um, on, on the contracts is not approved. So in this paragraph below the table on investigations, we're just highlighting the, the issue, like I said in my earlier presentation on the prior year matter uh, in relation to the sub-enterprise reporting system where the um, investigations were, con were concluded. However, there's still no disciplinary action that has been taken um, in terms of the recommendations of the investigation. Some of the key, um, some of the key measures or the, 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 the the improvements that we re really recommend that need to be implemented within the fund to ensure that the environment is conducive for effective consequence management is one, the measures to manage consequences, the sanctions and recommendations that are not implemented for completed um, 
investigations and the failure to properly deal with allegations reported in the prior year. So these are the key elements that are lacking within the department, within the fund rather, to ensure that consequence management is effectively implemented. Fruitless and wasteful expenditure in the current year, the fund did not have any fruitless and wasteful expenditure disclosed. It's only that relating to the prior year, which was on the um, lease payments paid for or a parking lease for a, where the funds head office are allocated, allocated at. Um, drivers of internal controls chair, if I move on to page um, 13, the top of page 13, the drivers of internal control. So they were just flagging the um, key uh, internal control deficiencies. Um, if I look at, at, at leadership, so we have three elements, it's leadership, financial performance management, as well as the governance area. On leadership, we are indicating that although management did um, develop the action plan to address uh, internal control deficiencies, we have, however, noted that um, the implementation thereof was not effective, being that um, it is also evident with the repeat qualification areas that we have highlighted. And also the root causes were not adequately addressed as if the root causes of these findings are not addressed, they do then result, they may then result in, in other material misstatements. In the case of the UIF, we have seen the regression based on the number of qualification areas that um, we have reported on in the current financial year. Also, again, under leadership, we are facing also highlighting the, the, the lack of direction and oversight over the ICT governance at the department, which also has a direct impact on the UIF, where it is not adequate, adequately and effectively maintained as the ICT committees were not functional. There was also a lack of management reporting structure around the evaluation of expenditure pertaining to the software licenses as well as the SAP licenses. And there were also weaknesses identified that have also been reported in the department, in the department's um, report as well that impact on the US, UIF's IT governance um, sphere as well. In addition, still on the IT governance, we also noted that um, there are issues around security management, program change management, user access management, and IC, ICT service continuity. So there's also area, the other an additional area that we identified within the UIF's own internal um, IT governance sphere as well is in relation to the design and implementation of controls around security management, user access, program change management, as well as ICT continuity and physical access as well. In financial and performance management, Jim, the quality of the financial statements remains a, a serious concern. As I highlighted, the financial management activities with or controls within the entity have regressed. And we raised that as a concern based on the numerous areas that either need, needed to be adjusted or corrected on the financial set of financial statements that were initially submitted for audit, and as well as speaking to the qualification areas as well, which um, the corrections remain un, or for which the misstatements rather remain uncorrected. The second element that we still raise as a concern is the lack of proper um, record keeping within the fund to ensure that there is um, appropriate and timely manner to support financial and uh, performance reporting. And I spoke to the issues on investments again that we will ensure that the financial information that is then published in the annual report and for uh, for, for the public to, to, to analyze and, and use um, is not reliable as it did not take into account as well the, the investments that the fund need to be reporting on and make sure that um, those are fully disclosed in the financial statements. Management did also not ensure that there's adequate controls relating to the monthly and, and, and daily processing and reconciling of, of transactions. And this primarily also mirrors the, um, the issues that are highlighted in the qualification areas as well. And these uh, controls are the ones that will also enable the regular and accurate and complete reporting of the financial performance of the fund, which in this um, point of time, we are really concerned about the effectiveness thereof. Management did also not um, review and monitor compliance with applicable laws and regulations. This speaks to the compliance um, findings that I spoke to earlier around financial statements, around the performance report, around consequence management, and also around expenditure management. There were also delays experienced with regards to submission of requested information. And this was also as a result of inadequate controls around record keeping that remains a concern as well and resulted in some of the limitations that we have expressed and communicated in the qualification areas. 
management and those charged um, with the responsibility to perform oversight and governance functions should work towards improving the key controls and addressing the root causes and ensuring that there is an improvement in key risk areas and therefore providing for adequate assurance on the quality of the financial statement and the actual achievement of targets reported in the annual performance report or the quarterly performance um, report as well. We are also further saying that the accounting authority to then ensure that the proper reviews and monitoring are done on internal controls relating to financial reporting to ensure that possible issues are identified and corrected timelessly. And this again speaks to the effective implementation of the action plan itself, the audit action plan. If I go to section 2.5, which is on page 15 of your report, Jim, um, here we speak to the COVID-19 test. So here it's just um, to highlight to, to the committee as well that um, um, a part of the, 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 the audit, actually the, the TES um, audit will be covered in the upcoming 2021 regulatory audit with the COVID TES um, where we issued the special report one and we also issued the special report two all those findings um, will be followed up on in this cycle as the cycle that it just ended on the 31st of March 2021 is the financial year that we'll be auditing in order to express an opinion on, 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 on the um, expenditure in relation to the tears. As you can recall, perhaps from the presentation that we did to the committee in terms of special report one, we're mainly just highlighting some of the key risk areas and some of the key observations based on a, um, the analytical um, 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 audits that we would have performed as well as some of the um, IT governance um, findings that we had communicated. So the, the 2021 audit would be the one where we actually expressing an opinion on the expenditure itself. Um, the key recommendations to the fund that we had made, one of the key um, concerns and the key recommendations remains that in relation to the investments, being that there should be continuous monitoring and evaluation of those investments, and it is critical and vital that there is a systematic measure and assessment of those investments that will then enable um, the accurate financial reporting of the performance of the fund itself. This will also ensure that the progress of implementation and the outputs are systematically um, assessed and evaluated continuously throughout the year and not necessarily um, at, at the end when we need to then report on the financial performance or position of the entity. Further, it will also ensure that the internal control environment is enhanced and we therefore reduce the risk of the loss of the asset loss within the fund and help ensure that reported information is further complete and accurate and that the financial statements are reliable. The next recommendation that we make is that the fund needs to then go back and revisit the internal control processes on the review of financial statements because that remains a critical concern as well. The risk assessment process and action plans should continuously be monitored and assessed for effectiveness and ensure timely responses to material issues. The last element is in relation to the consequence management. Ensure that there is implementation and monitoring uh, of consequence management by ensuring that those that are found guilty of transgressing uh, or incurring, in respect of incurring irregular expenditure or fruitless and wasteful expenditure, that those um, are, 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 are brought to book and that the disciplinary hearings are held as recommended and the due processes are then followed in terms of the regulations. The key recommendation to the committee is to monitor the implementation of the resolution taken by the committee to ensure effective implementation and feedback. And like I said, I think some of the key things that we are highlighting, especially around consequence management or something that we had brought to the attention of the committee in the prior financial year. Um, I thank you so much, Chair. I'll hand over to you, BE. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Nana. I think, uh... Chair, um, really the, the message for the UIF, um, one is that we saying we, we see a lot of potential in the UIF, I think over the years, you would note that their biggest problem is just on the financial management, the date, the discipline to adhere to the day-to-day -day controls that in some instances they put in place. So the biggest part of their control environment, they put policies, they put procedures with an exception of the matter relating to the investment. But when it comes to the preparation of the financial statement, especially in the current year, there were instances where they even reversed some of the gains that they had. So some of the qualification paragraph that we had given them this year, they used to do it quite well in the previous year, but 
their finance division would have went and reversed some of those journals and thereby frustrating almost the reporting of the financial statement. And we highlight all they need to do is to maintain the momentum of what they've been doing throughout the years. However, work on the issue around the monies that they're investing, especially in the unlisted companies, because the monitoring thereof ought to happen early, such that it's not an issue of when the AG asks about the reporting at the end of the financial year, but it's about monitoring the performance of these investments such that you know if your money is well positioned way before the year end, because then the reporting just becomes the last leg of closing. But we, what we found is that they, they're driving so much of the financial statements in the last minute, especially around the investment, that it will become almost impossible for them to close it. And that's a conversation we are having with the fund. On the highlight about the special report um, on the COVID, we highlighted in the document that we've issued, as you may be aware, we've issued SR1 around the 2nd or so of October. We issued the SR the special report number two, um, it's tabled by the AG um, early December last year as well. So it's been six months of almost plus minus five to six months of them having our feedback in terms of what are the things that we had hoped that they work on them before we got to express an opinion that we would be doing in the financial year 2021. So we are hoping that they will have gone quite a great, um, it, 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 they would have gone in a long way, trying to address the red flags that we put on their table right from September, August, September, up until December. So that follow up and the expression of the opinion will fall within the current financial year. So that's just in summary for us, for, for, for UIF. In terms of their, their committees, being your audit committee and the internal audit, we found that they add value. Um, what needs to happen is that management needs to be disciplined, especially around the financial management, uh, being your um, the preparation of the financial statements such that it's not the last minute run around that is dependent on the auditor to either pick it or hope that the auditor may not pick it up. Thank you so much, Chair. Chairman. 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 I don't know what's going on. My, yeah, sorry, colleagues. My muting is unmuting. All right. All right. I was checking for hands. Thank you very much, AG, for the very comprehensive uh, briefing uh, on the UIF. Um, right, honorable list, you first off the bat. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank you to the AG. Um, I, I, yeah, we do appreciate that the AG will focus, obviously, on the financial aspects, and and I don't know that there is a great deal to celebrate um, here as compared with the Compensation Commissioner, but perhaps a little bit better. But just, it's bad. It's very bad, and. But there are other aspects, and 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 my colleagues will recall the the chaos um, of the the offices in 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 Pretoria, um, you know, with with backlogs of emails, over four hundred thousand telephone calls in the thousands, but only a few able to be dealt with on a daily basis. A majority, I think, it was about two thirds of the telephone calls went unanswered. Um, and so on. So, so it's it's financial chaos, as the AG points out. But I think it's it's bigger, and and so it's a very similar picture to the compensation commission, and it's under the same portfolio committee, the same minister, and so a lot of what we we said about the compensation commission um, has to apply here. Um, the, the there's been no consequence. Uh, management for for the accounting officer that I'm aware of, um, and 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 there doesn't seem to be the kind of urgency um, from from the relevant and frequent ch changed ministers, and also from the portfolio committee. So, what I'm suggesting, Mr. Chairman, is that we we whilst both these entities are massive um, 
challenges in their own right. Um, perhaps we can look at them um, in a similar sort of way when, when we deal with them. And, and I'm sure many of the questions that were asked by my colleagues in terms of compensation fund um, would apply here as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Honorable Samuel. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chair, colleagues. Uh, thanks to the uh, Office of the uh, AG. Um, indeed, I, I agree with um, um, Honorable Lewis that that what we the story we hear is, is similar to what we have uh, heard from the compensation fund, though. Uh, uh, on some areas of improvement here and there. Um, there's, there's a lot of justification uh, of, of the president's uh, assignment to uh, the SIU for investigations, uh, something which I, need, I think we need to appreciate. And probably when we deal with uh, them uh, at whatever period, uh, the SIU, SIU should uh, give us their uh, a view, though it's still of the earlier stages uh, in terms of such a um, uh, investigation. I know that uh, um, the uh, actual determination was made, I think uh, uh, two, two months, two months ago, two months ago. Uh, so so, so uh, there, is, there is a level of enforcing uh, some form of accountability to that. But I would, uh, I'd love to know from the uh, AG uh, is the fact that it, it looks like both both uh, uh, entities are clearly uh, uh, bordering on 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 the high level of a uh, uh, material regularity, and and therefore um, uh, it looks like that that would qualify them. Uh, for a material irregularity uh, audit uh, to enforce some form of action uh, in as far as uh, accountability uh, is concerned and consequence management uh, based on what we see uh, as the outcome of these uh, uh, audits, both the conversation fund and the, and the UIF. Thank you very much, Chair. All right, colleagues, are there any further hands? I didn't see any in the group, but I think one can safely say that the process to be employed in so far as compensation fund is concerned is equally as relevant uh, to the UIF. And what is noteworthy, of course, are that these uh, entities fall within one department, has already been pointed out. And so clearly something is, is, is very wrong. So can I hand over to the AG for a reaction to those uh, uh, comments, <clears throat> if there are any, and then we can immediately go into the next presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very much, Chairperson. Um, grateful again for the comments and reactions of, of the honorable members. Um, I think Honorable Somio made a comment around um, UIF is also bordering the material irregularity audit. Um, we had initially not um, listed them as part of the entities. We only including them for the first time for the 2021 financial year. So you are right, your assessment, Honorable Somio, is correct. So UIF would also be assessed for the possibility of the material irregularity because we'll be facing in the amended public audit act for them for the first time um, in this uh, financial year 2021. I think that's just um, the comfort I needed to give just to agree with the comment from Honorable Solmio, but nothing extra chairperson from our side um, without repeating some of the comments made already. If, if the committee is ready chairperson, I wanted to allow um, Ms. Zamatlangum Dija to then take us through the presentation on, on the National Skills Fund. Um, Zama?
Zama and the chair are missing. Where is Zama and where is the chair? Apologies for that. Um, good morning um, to the chairperson. Um, good morning to the honor members of the committee. Um, I was trying to share the document. Um, I think I'm still struggling. So can I just request to be given hours to be able to share the document? Um, Already granted. Okay. Um, I'm struggling a bit to be able to. Just apologies on that. Okay, I found. Can I just get an indication that the document is showing on my on on the screen? Oh, oh yes, you could so. go. Great, thank you so much. Um, again, um, good uh, morning to the chairperson and the members, the honorable members of the committee. Um, as mentioned, my name is Zamashang Umdichwa. I'll be taking you through the audit outcomes of the National Skills Fund um, for the 1920 financial year. So if you just allow me to proceed. Um, so, as part of my presentation, I'll be taking you through um, the audit opinion history, which will involve the financial state, um, detail the financial statements elements, the predetermined objectives, um, the compliance with laws and regulations. And then I'll also take you through other matters of interest, which would be your irregular expenditure and fruitless and wasteful expenditure analysis. Um, I'll take you through the drivers of the internal controls, um, recommendations to the fund, um, and also to the, um, to the committee. So just to get um, right on it, um, basically just to highlight our reputational promise, which has already been covered a lot by my previous um, um, speakers. So I'll just highlight that um, basically as a supreme audit institution, um, we exist to strengthen our country's democracy by enabling oversight, accountability, and governance in the public sector through auditing, thereby building public confidence. Um, and then the purpose, as indicated, is just to highlight the audit outcomes of the National Skills Fund from the 19, for the 1920 financial year. So to give an overview of the National Skills Fund, um, it was established in 1999 in terms of the Skills Development Act, which we refer to as the SDA. Um, and then basically their mandate is to fund is, um, of the fund is to use the money for the primary objective um, which is to fund projects identified in the National Skills Development Strategy um, as national priorities, to find projects that are, are related to the achievement of the purpose of the SDA um, as determined by the Director General, um, to find activities to achieve the national um, standards on good practice, and then, also, and then also to administer the fund within the prescribed um, limit. And then the funding of the uh, National Skills Fund is um, basically the 20% of the skills development levies um, as contemplated in the SDA. And then other sources of income can be um, the skills development levies connected um, from other employees that are not necessarily um, CETAs, money appropriated by the um, by parliament, donations to the fund, and money received from any other source. But predominantly in the 1920 financial year and in the prior year, um, which is the 1819 year, the main uh, source of revenue of the National Skills Fund has been um, the skills development levies. Now, to take you through the audit opinion history of the National Skills Fund, um, you will note that there has been a regression in the audit outcomes um, from the 2015 financial year up until the 2019-20 year that we are currently looking at now. Um, so for three years, they have been unqualified with findings, which is the yellow color there. However, from um, the 1819 year to the 1920, there has been a regression with the prior year, which is the 1819 being qualified. And then now currently there is a disclaimer of opinion that has been um, call it exp expressed. Um, just to take you through the qualification areas, just this table just highlights the areas that we have qualified or where we had material misstatements or material limitations within um, the financial statements, starting with the financial statements. So you'd note that we've got qualification areas there that we've highlighted for the 1920 year, um, which I will take you through the detail when I've actually taken you through the basis for the, um, the opinion that we expressed or the disclaimer of opinion. Rather, but I just want to highlight on 
the comparison between the 1819 year and the 1920 year, you'd note that um, on accruals from non-exchange transactions together with trade and other receivables from non-exchange, these have actually come through from the prior year as well. So we had qualifications in the prior year for accruals from non-exchange ex ex transactions together with trade and trade receivables. And predominantly this speaks to the um, an issue that we have identified or um, we have been raised relating to skills development um, funding expenditure in the National Skills Fund, basically the supporting documentation relating to the skills development funding expenditure in the National Skills Fund, which basically speaks to the mandate of the National Skills Fund, because you know that the mandate of the National Skills Fund is predominantly the skills um, development initiatives that they are funding. So what do we are finding as a challenge or a a concern is the fact that we are struggling to obtain supporting documentation for the skills development expenditure that they would have incurred or evidence basically that the skills initiatives that they would be have paid the service providers for there's actually evidence that they actually have happened those um, skills development activities so you'd find that now in the current year a lot of the qualification areas that i'll take you through are actually affected by the lack of support for the skills development initiatives that they actually um have undertaken and have already advanced funds to the um, skills development service providers for. Um, just on predetermined objectives, um, we have identified also um, statements on under usefulness and reliability um, in the 1920 financial year. Um, and then for compliance with laws and regulations, you'd note that we also have um, a call it a concern with the credibility of the financial statements that are actually submitted um, for audit processes by, um, by the National Skills Fund. Because you'd note that throughout the years that we're actually looking at now, from the 15, 16 year to the 19, 20, we have had a mater um, material misstatements in the financial statements that have been identified, um, which I guess in the 18, 19 year and 19, 20 year, those misstatements are not necessarily corrected, which then led to the modified opinions that we have. Um, so on the financial statements, just on the bottom of um, page five, um, starting with 2.1, we're just highlighting that the NSF did not keep full and proper records of the affairs of the entity to ensure that the financial and performance information is supported by valid, accurate, and complete supporting documentation. And this speaks to what I just highlighted with, with regards to the skills development activities um, that the NSF is actually um, involved in. So there would be um, um, advancing funds to the skills development service providers. And then there would be an expectation that the skills and the service providers actually perform the services, um, which is the um, initiatives that there would be the training initiatives with a or the skills development initiatives that they'd actually be involved in and the expectation that there's actually support that that is actually happening which is monitored by the nsf but we're finding that we actually lacking supporting documentation to actually validate that such skills development activities actually have happened um, in order for them to actually recognize the call it the expenditure and other elements in the financial statements so in addition daily monthly and uh, uh, reconciliations and processing controls were not implemented throughout the financial period, um, which then speaks to what I just highlighted re relating to the credibility of the financial statements, because without these controls in place, which is the daily and monthly reconciliations, the financial statements that we end up having um, um, that is actually received for audit purposes actually results in a lot of material misstatements that we have to, that we actually now identifying. And the below root causes are identified to be the cause of the internal control deficiencies noted. Um, a lack of financial disciplines to ensure that the records of the entity reconcile and are accurate. Um, improper record keeping and project monitoring resulting in the unavailability of originating source documents to support the financial and performance information which speaks to the skills development um, expenditure that I was just highlighting now. Um, a lack of regular reviews and reconciliation of financial and performance information, again, supporting evidence, which speaks to the financial statements being containing material misstatements. Um, project approvals that are not in accordance with the framework and criteria for the allocation of the funds. And then we also noted a high vacancy rate um, within the institution, which then speaks to the um, absence of people to actually layer these critical internal controls that we are highlighting as deficiencies. 
Um, so the matters relating to the adequate support of skills development funding expenditure, the disclosure of the amounts owed by the service providers on completion of the project or expiry of the contract, um, which affects the trade receivable balance, as well as the disclosure of this of SAR as part of the principal agent arrangement. These are the areas that were um, disputed by the NSF and referred to the National Treasury by management. So um, the NSF has since received feedback from the National Treasury, and we have also had further engagements with the NSF. We, um, I think the, all the matters were ironed out, and um, I think we, we are at a stage where we feel that NSF is actually in a position or is well equipped to be able to develop adequate action plans to be able to respond to the areas that have been identified so that we don't necessarily find ourselves in the situation where we are call it regressing um, or having a repeat qualification areas like it has been done in the past. Um, and then the details of the basis for disclaimer of opinion, um, as indicated, there has been a regression um, over the past two years um, from the 18, 19 year, and then in the current year that we're looking at, which is a 19, 20 year being a disclaimer of opinion. So starting with skills development um, funding expenses, um, there, there was inadequate project monitoring and expenditure approval processes at the entity, resulting in expenditure incurred on projects not supported by adequate supporting documentation. And I think the reason why we're highlighting that there was inadequate expenditure approval processes is because the information or the supporting documentation that we were actually requesting is actually meant to be a process that is already being followed by the NSF in them approving the expense because in terms of the memorandum of agreements that they have with the service providers before they can actually um, process a payment um, to the um, service providers um, or actually even recognize the expenditure there needs to be certain supporting documentation that is supported um, um, so that the 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 fund can actually satisfy themselves that the skills development activities are actually happening and that funds can be actually payments can be made however this was lacking hence we're saying that there was um there was a the expenditure approval processes was not adequate at the institution which then led to them not having the adequate supporting documentation um, and then overall the nsf did not have adequate supporting evidence to confirm the expenditure for the skills development activities that the nsf has already um, advanced funds towards Therefore, confirmation that learning activity took place could not always be verified, which then speaks to what I highlighted earlier that um, the concern regarding the skills development expenditure um, supporting documentation um, is concerned because of the fact that it deals with the core mandate of the institution. So the fact that we are not able to confirm that learning activity is actually taking place is what is a concern and actually has, ends up having an impact on other areas of the financial statements. Like, for example, if I just move to the next one, which is accrual from non-exchange transactions. Um, so we're saying here, the NSF did not have adequate project management in place to determine the percentage of completion of the projects um, to enable them to recognize the expenditure in terms of the graph standard. Um, this resulted in the entity being unable to provide audit evidence that the accruals from non-exchange transactions and the related skills development expenditure had been correctly accounted for as sufficient appropriate audit evidence that the services were rendered could not be provided. So the key area um, that we highlighted is that we could not get evidence that the services were rendered by the skills development um, service providers for which the NSF has actually already advanced funds towards. So we were highlighting that we are um, struggling to, we were struggled to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence for the services that were rendered. Um, and then again here, we highlighting that the action plan to address the prior findings was not adequate, adequately implemented and monitored as this was also a prior, um, prior period qualification. So it's not the first time that we'd be raising um, the issues relating to the importance of having supporting documentation that actually skills development is happening or that the services have been rendered um, because we actually experienced this in the prior and in the current year or in the 1920 year, we actually experienced the same um, um, challenges. And then on trade and other receivables, um, so the NSF incorrectly, um, an incorrect accounting policy change um, resulting in the departure from GRAP 104 and further resulting in inadequate impairment and discounting assessment as a result of incorrect aging of receivables. So the NSF went through a process of actually amending the accounting policy 
which um, for them to recognize a receivable um, in the financial statements, let's say in the prior year, they, um, they would recognize a receivable where they actually indicating that the skills development service providers owe them a certain amount after the contract has actually lapsed. So the NSF would advance funds to a service provider to um, do a special learning initiative. And then the service provider is then obviously need to um, go through the process of actually uh, conducting the, um, the, 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 the skills development initiative. And then if there's any funds that are left behind um, that would have been advanced by the NSF after the contract lapses, that fund is needs to be returned back to the NSF, um, which is then, that's why they recognize it as a receivable. So now they went in, in the current year, which is the 1920, they went and amended the accounting policy um, to say that they will only recognize a debt from the service provider, which is a receivable, only when the, con or the, the, the project has been completed and they have received a, um, a, a, a closeout report. So, which is contrary or which is against what was a, a contractual agreement between the service provider and the NSF, because in terms of the MOA with the service providers, the service provider is meant to pay back all unutilized funds to the NSF once the contract lapses or there has been a termination of the contract. So this change in the accounting policy was in, not in terms of GRAB 104, which is basically when they should be accounting for a receivable in terms of the GRAB standards. And then also it was not in terms of what would have been contractually agreed with the service providers, which then resulted in them now incorrectly recognizing the, their receivables. Um, and then which has an impact also on the impairment assessment that they did. The NSF also made um, restatements to the financial statements um, that were not supported by adequate supporting documentation. And this was due to inadequate project monitoring and expenditure approval processes, which is similar to um, what I raised under accruals, because there needs to be a process of them monitoring the processes so that, and the projects so that they are aware of the stage of completion of the project or where the, 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 the project is, so that they determine how much is still, um, call it a receivable, in terms of the um, 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 of what is owed by the service provider, especially after the, call it the, 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 the contract has lapsed or there has been a termination of the contract. And then again, the action plan to address the prior findings um, was not adequately implemented and monitored because this was an area that was raised in the prior as well and still continues in the current year. If I move over to the next item of qualification, it refers to the commitments and earmarked funds where we're saying that it was, there was inadequate project monit um, monitoring and expenditure approval processes as the entity, um, at the entity resulting in expenditure incurred on projects not being supported by adequate supporting documentation. This then posed the scope limitation on the verification of the commitments balance um, that was disclosed on the financial statements. Um, so there was also an unsupported adjustment made to the financial statements submitted for audit, which could not necessarily be sub, um, supported by supporting documentation, which then lead, led to a scope limitation. So basically just um, um, honorable members, you'd note that the four items that I've already touched on speak to the um, skills develop the supporting documentation for the skills development expenditure that would have been incurred by the institution, which speaks to also the project monitoring processes that they have in place, which are not call it adequate for them to be able to correctly account for uh, the expenditure, the accruals, the um, receivables together with the commitments on the financial statements. Um, if I move to the next item on page seven, um, would be the TVET College infrastructure assets. So an impairment assessment was not adequately conducted. The entity was required to assess the conditions of the infrastructure assets at the colleges and determine if the conditions of the asset had been diminished. Where the, com and the conditions appears to have impaired, this should have been disclosed in order to determine the accurate value of the assets. Um, so we had call it an issue on the impairment process that they did with regards to the infrastructure assets. And then also further delays, there were significant delays in the completion of the infrastructure assets, um, which then necessitated that they actually do an assessment of the actual conditions of the assets so that they determine the actual value. So in terms of the GRAP standards, they were also meant to go through a process of actually 
documenting the reasons for the significant delays in the completion of these infrastructure projects, um, and which is something that was not necessarily um, done on the end of financial statements. So there was a lack of adequate controls over the assets under construction, which resulted in the entity not being able to account for the infrastructure assets. Um, we also identified um, statements on the cash flow statement um, of the National Skills Fund, um, where we, under Nash cash flow from operating activities, where the cash paid to suppliers, um, to stakeholders, suppliers, and employees was incorrectly cal calculated as it did not agree to the actual payments that were being that were made, and this was due to a lack of adequate controls over the preparation of the financial statements which then also speaks to the net cash, net cash flow from investing activities, where they included um, non-cash flow items in the calculation, which then resulted in misstatements that we identified. Um, so we had those misstatements that we identified on the cash flow statement. And then on re related parties, um, there were various errors identified in the calculation of the amounts disclosed in the related party transactions. Um, where there was double counting that was identified. And then basically management did not ensure that the related party note is re reviewed for accuracy. Um, we had identified um, misstatements on the prior period error corrected, um, where the prior period error note also contained various errors and in some st instances were not supported by reliable evidence. So there was quite a number of, of restatements that they did to the prior financial statement values. However, they could not substantiate with um, supporting audit evidence. And then also the last area of qualification is the principal agent arrangement, where there was inadequate evaluation of the arrangement with uh, SARS for the collection of a levies on behalf of the department in order to distribute to the CITES and the NSF um, per the Skills Development Act. The GRAB a standard defines the requirement in, of the agent principal arrangement to be disclosed. And then the evaluation that the NSF did um, on actually assessing the principal agent arrangement between the NSF and um, SARS was incorrect and did not comply with the um, requirement of, the, of, of SARS. Um, which is why we had a, call it a, a material misstatement on the disclosure that they made um, on that um, principal agent arrangement. So moving on to predetermined objectives, um, the program that we looked at is program one, which deals with the funding skills development. So we had also identified quite a number of material misstatements in this area under both usefulness and reliability. So sufficient appropriate audit evidence was not provided to uh, support the reasons for the variances between the plan target and the reported achievement um, um, on the annual performance report for 13 indicators. Um, we had um, sufficient appropriate audit evidence not provided for 13 of the 22 indicators. And then we had instances where there were material misstatements due to a um, on six indicators where what is reported does not correspond with what is provided as supporting documentation, which then resulted in errors being reported. So those are the areas that we highlighted on the audit or based on the conclusion on the audit of predetermined objectives. If I move now to compliance with legislation um, on annual financial statements, um, I've already indicated that the financial statements um, submitted for auditing were not prepared in accordance with the prescribed financial reporting framework and supported by full and proper records, which is something that has been consistently happening in the National Skills Fund over the past five years. Um, and then on expenditure management, the entity could not provide sufficient appropriate audit evidence to confirm that assessment of cost effectiveness of the skills development project was adequately performed prior to the contracts being awarded for service providers to ensure that economic use of resources of the entities um, of the entities funds. So we couldn't get evidence that an entire process was actually followed in terms of the framework. The framework of the institution actually highlights the processes that they meant to follow in making sure that um, the the skills development grants are actually afford, awarded to skills um, for cost effective um, cost effectiveness to the skills development um, service providers. So we couldn't get evidence that that initiation process was done in terms of the framework to in order for there to be 
um, economic use of the resources of the entity. Um, under consequence management, um, sufficient audit evidence um, that disciplinary steps were taken against officials who had incurred irregular expenditure could not be obtained. Um, this was due to the previous year's irregular expenditure not being conducted. So they didn't perform investigation of the irregular expenditure that was identified in the prior year. Um, prior irregular expenditure relates to two construction contracts that were entered into in the prior years for Tibet infrastructure. I'll take you through the actual detail of the irregular expenditure when I'm going through that, um, which is the next part of my presentation. So the other matters of interest as I highlighted, I'll be taking you through the irregular expenditure and fruitless and wasteful expenditure, just the detail of it. So there has been an equality regression in this area as there has been an increase in the irregular expenditure balance. Um, in the current year, there is 23 million, um, 23 um, million compared to um, in the prior year, which is 432. So if you, no, sorry, if you compare to the prior year of 4.6 million, um, the key contributor of the irregular expenditure relates to um, construction, TVET college construction contracts that were entered into in contravention of the CIDB um, standards. Um, and this has been an, a, call it an ongoing, con these ongoing contracts, which means that um, the entity still keeps incurring irregular expenditure. And it speaks to the area that I just touched on under consequence management where there has not been adequate investigation so that um, adequate disciplinary is taken on upon investigation of this um, irregular expenditure. So the breakdown of the irregular expenditure is um, the first, what I highlighted, the CIDB grading requirement not met. And then there was two areas where there was cost overruns, um, the small amounts there, which is 65,000, the 1.5 million there. So those are the areas that resulted in the irregular expenditure that is disclosed in the financial statements um, of the institution. And then for fruitless and wasteful expenditure, the regression is in the fact that in the prior year, there was no irregular fruitless and wasteful expenditure. But in the current year, the entity had 5.6 million um, fruitless and wasteful expenditure. And this relates to um, the NSF provided funds to a, um, a service provider that was subsequently sequestrated. The NSF did not take effective steps to confirm the good standing of the entity prior to the awarding of the contract. Further, the fund did not ensure that it was part of the creditors during the sequestration process to enable the recovery of the funds advanced at the entity. So this is what actually led to them now having the fruitless and wasteful expenditure because there was a possibility, there was a opportunity um, during the sequestration process that the department or the NSF um, listed as part of the creditors so that there could be a recovery of some of the funds but this process was not done which then led to them incurring fruitless and visual expenditure of 5.6 million um now the drivers of the internal controls um are not necessarily looking good um which basically is testaments to the areas that i was highlighting which led to the opinion or the disclaim of opinion that we currently um on so the internal controls are not in place and intervention is required to design and implement the appropriate controls in in majority of the areas um, from leadership to financial management and performance and to government so the only areas that we're saying that um, progress has been made is relating to the it governance and it systems and then the government um like your internal audit and audit committee, but majority of the internal control um, areas they, we have identified that intervention is required to design um, appropriate controls. So just to highlight the deficiencies that we, uh, um, we um, identified. So under leadership, leadership did not ensure adequate controls are implemented over the preparation of the financial and performance report the financial statements and the annual performance report submitted for auditing contain various misstatements identified by the audit process, as I've already highlighted. And then policies and procedures are not adequate to support and ensure the process um, for complete and accurate financial preparation and reporting. And then action plans were not adequately developed resulting in repeat qualification, which speaks to the two qualification areas that I highlighted as being repeat from the 1819 year. 
Now, again, on financial and performance management, the entity did not have adequate uh, systems of record management as supporting documentation was not readily available. This resulted in significant delays in, delays in the submission of audit evidence. And in some instances, the evidence was not submitted um, for, for audit purposes. And then management did not, did not adequately review financial statements and performance reports before submission. And then also the, in the implementation of the action plans. So this basically speaks to the areas um, relating to the scope limitations that we had, and then also dealing with the adequacy of the financial statements um, that were submitted for audit, and then also the action plans that, um, um, that they have in place, which then resulted in them having a repeat qualification areas. And then on governance, management did not adequately address the findings from the previous year performed by internal audit and audit committee, um, of the, on the financial statements and the annual performance report, because some of the areas would have been raised by the internal audit and the audit committee, but not necessarily implemented by management, which then resulted in us raising the issues again um, as external auditors. Now, the key recommendations um, to the fund um, that we've communicated, um, the NSF has a framework and criteria for the allocation of funds, which, it, which determines how service providers should be evaluated prior to the awarding of the project. Further, um, there was the, um, the NSF has men, memorandum of agreements with the skills development service providers, which I aimed to direct the SDPs, which is the skills development providers, on the implementation of the identified learning inter in, interventions on the use of the project funds and on the reporting of the funds. However, we would find that there's a bit of a misalignment between now these documents and the actual project management activities um, that the NSF would be doing um, because they don't go into the detail of actually um, going through what is required by the MOAs and in order to hold the service skill, the skills development service providers um, accountable. Um, so the alignment of these um, activities would assist um, further, there's a need to improve the record management systems to ensure that information at, um, from the different service providers is verified for reliability and relevance and collated to support the financial and performance information reported. And then the action plans should be developed, implemented and monitored to ensure that root causes are addressed so that we um, call it to avoid a situation of having to raise repeat findings like we have been doing. Now, recommendation to the committee: um, the committee um, to obtain a report on the funds investigate on the fund in, that they find investigated the key findings relating to the skills development expenditure. The committee to obtain reports whether the accounting officer is taking appropriate action to investigate all cases of irregular expenditure as well as fruitless and wasteful expenditure, together with the potential irregular expenditure and fruitless and wasteful expenditure cases carried over from the prior years, so that so as to determine if there's any losses that have in, um, been suffered and whether such expenditure can be recovered from responsible officials. And then also that the committee to obtain reports that the accounting officer um, is taking appropriate action to investigate all cases of resources of the entity that have not been used economically to determine whether losses were suffered by the fund and whether such expenditure should be recovered from responsible officials. And then lastly, the committee should obtain the reports to ensure that consequence management has been implemented at the National Skills Fund which is what we have highlighted as not necessary. There's no evidence that consequence management is actually taking place. Um, thank you, BE. I'll hand over back to you. Um, thank you so much, um, Sama. Um, I think Chairperson, we, I see that we are taking a bit of time from the committee. But in a nutshell, I think for the, for the um, NSF, we are saying that our biggest challenge is around the skills development expenditure, which is core of the, the NSF business. And we're saying that as, as part of the evidence that we are requesting as auditors, it's just proof that the money ended where it ought to have ended. So if you have learners that ought to have been taken through the learning um, and, and skills development activity, we were requesting that we get to that level of evidence and not just an invoice from a service provider and not just the report from the NSF project manager. But if you say that you had, if the service provider said I've paid stipend 
to students, we ask that please just demonstrate that the students received that money. And I think that's where there was a, um, there was a challenge. Um, you would recall that the last time that um, the committee said in relation to the NSF, it was just about whether they, why they were tabling later that pending time. And I think they highlighted that they had dispute with our findings. We allowed them to take the matter through to Treasury because that's what they had asked. Um, Treasury came back and just clarified again the same principle that where they, we had since taken an engagement with, with them. And we believe from our side that we settled it. They fully appraised and understand uh, what needs to happen. The commitment we received um, from management was that they are working on the matters, particularly in ensuring that they can prove that the money had ended where it ought to have ended and not just the report on, on a high level. Thank you, Chairperson, um, from our side. All right, thank you very much, uh, AG, for another very thorough presentation um, to the state of affairs, the NSF. Um, Honorable Mente, you'll be first off the bat. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I'm, I'm glad I raised my hand before uh, the, there was a clarity from the leader of, of FAG in terms of, 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 T, of Treasury. So I wanted to check what is the explanation given by management to you that is comforting for them not to have necessary documentation to prove their expenditure, especially where it comes to, for instance, um, projects that are directed at skills development where money was clearly spent, as you are indicating, I think it was under point two, where you're indicating that money was spent but uh, and disclosed on their financials, but there is no documentation. And it leaves a bitter taste, I think, even in your mouth when you see a large sum of amount has been spent and indicated to have been spent, but there is no documentation. I'm, I'm keen to understand what then becomes their response or explanation to that effect uh, uh, to you. Because what I'm observing, Chair, is that there is a systematic collapse or intent to collapse governance systems across these funding uh, structures we've just now dealt with. And I, I, I'm, I'm praying that it's only me who is picking up the similarities and where it's money in, money out, but there is no accountability. And also, how do you then deal with this matter when the explanation is not sufficient for you to understand it? I'm glad that there was an interaction with Treasury from their side, but what, what then becomes Treasury's response to that particular matter of not producing any banking document to an expenditure that you have incurred? And it's clear even in your books. And which law then they utilize to say, okay, give us some time to work on it. Why didn't you work on it before? I'm just I'm just not comfortable with this because this, this system, which is now starting here at NSF, is the same system I've picked up on the document of the compensation fund, where a disclaimer started like this and then it continued all the way. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mente. Um, are there any further uh, hands? Uh, Honorable Tolasha? Honorable Chairperson, thank you very much. Chair, in appreciating the report, as Honorable Mente is saying, you find serious similarities in these kinds of reports, especially on the worst situation when it comes to fruitless and wasteful. Now, Chair, I don't want us to repeat ourselves. I just 
pity the AG's office when they are made to go back or allow people to go back and ask from treasury. Things that are obvious and known are in fact part of the legal framework that governs audit or the spending of, of, of our fiscals. You are made to go like you don't understand or they don't understand right in the middle of things, then everything must stop. You must be allowed to go to treasurer. You must come back. You give the same answer that you knew, in fact, it was going to be the answer. I don't think, Chair, we're going to get anything new. Just get to what we have discussed and agreed. Let the ministers come here, appear before us in the presence of everyone else, AG included. Let them give us, especially on the recommendations that the the AG is crafted chair. Not only get explanation, let's get the progress that they are making. And that progress, we ourselves are going to determine whether it's a meaningful progress or they're just playing time, Chairperson. I really would want to appreciate the AG with the kind of work that they are doing and the attitudes that they're experiencing, where people are doing things deliberately, just to waste time and create an impression that by Sugelwa. I think, Chair, let's, let's just up our game as a scoper. Of course, we are the last uh, in, in the line, but let's, let's be really, really vigorous. Let the minister be free and his team appear before us. Let, us. let him take us into confidence on the progress that they are doing. Let us find a way, Chair, I know there is no time, but even if just to go and make sure that we... we, we you know, Chair, these areas, the UAF, this, this, this fund, it, it, it's, a, it's a very, very sensitive matter, Chair, where is, this is actually where the service delivery talks volumes. If people cannot benefit, in fact, all everybody else, all the mischievous elements are benefiting. And we are told and given the same story all over again. And the AG keeps on coming with the worst report on annual basis. I think we must up our game. Let everybody who's affected come before us. Let, the, let them give us a progress that will be satisfactory. Let's see the uh, heads rolling, Chair. Let's see the heads rolling. If the minister can't make the head roll, why don't you, he's, just walk out and make sure that he's not there and make sure that we, we give back to the person that appointed him. So I am a little bit irritated, my apologies, for this kind of a behavior. Because Chair, people of South Africa are looking upon us. The courts, the, the commissions that are taking place, the parliament is seen to be one institution that is not doing its work. And indeed, people will allege us to say we're not doing our work if we accept these kind of reports that we re receive in the last financial year and we receive the worst this time and we're not being seen doing anything. Chair, I think I, I appreciate the report, but I really want to emphasize that we should be vigorous now. Something must be done differently by departments and the people that are made to lead these departments. Thank you to be long. Sorry to be long. Thank you so much, Chair. No, no need to apologize. Uh, I share your irritation um, as well. In, in fact, yeah. I think colleagues you will recall uh, when we, we, we met with the minister and there was the issues around NSFAS uh, that day. And then the issues around the skills fund were also, also raised. And uh, one suggestion at the time was that maybe a full-scale forensic investigation would be required. So I think let us keep that on the radar and look at the matters uh, moving forward. Right, Honorable Dirk? Yeah, uh, Chair, yeah, I will not repeat what everybody else has said all, all, all already, Chair. But uh, this is very, very disappointing, Chair. And, uh, you know, Chair, I'm actually happy that I'm serving on this, on this, on SCOPA. Uh, because at least here at Scopa, there's no politics that we, we, we are not playing politics and there's no politics that I need to call, apply to here. Uh, a rent is a rent and a cent is a cent. Non-compliance is non-compliance. Uh, so it's very, very straightforward, uh, our task that we have and our role that we must play as, as, as Scopa. Uh, I think we are all united in Scopa when it comes to these issues because we are dealing with factual issues. Uh, what in front of us is factual, and uh, we have to deal with it as it is. 
uh, as the pack sits in front of us, uh, we must uh, decide how we're going to move forward to these facts that has been presented, because what has been presented to us is facts. So we need to decide how we're going to de- uh, proceed with these facts in front of us, how we're going to deal with it, uh, Chair. Because Chair, at the end of the day, when our term of office is coming to an, uh, to an end, and uh, we are no longer here, uh, because you know years from now, reports will be, articles will be written about what took place in these uh, institutions. And uh, we will be, history will record us that we have failed for us because we have failed to play at the, our, de- our oversight role decisively. So, Chair, I think it's very, very important that uh, as COPA, we must be firm, we must be more decis- decisive, and we need to take action. And we want to see, there must be consequences, Chair. We can't continue like this here, what is happening here, and then there's no consequences. So we must ensure there's this consequences. And there's nothing, it's not political, there's nothing political. It's just about good, clean governance that we have to deal with here. And we must deal with it as, as such, such share. But I want us to be more firm here. Yeah? I want us to be, we must decide how we're going to well, move forward with, the, with these reports that we have received. But we can't be wishy-washy. We can't be uh, looking at no at it and we continue until our term comes to an end and no action has been taken, there was no consequence management, then we are none the better, Chair. Then we are none the better than, than, than what is happening in these institutions. So I want us to be more firm, Chair, and we must decide, maybe at another session, how we're going to proceed here, Chair. Because we ne- next year we'll have the same kind of situation. And the for the year after that, we'll just continue. And we'll become, comp- we'll become complicit in, 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 in what is happening in these institutions. Thank you, Chair. Right. I think there's an the agreement uh, that uh, the reports that we've received this morning, uh, all of them in their entirety, uh, discussing this uh, in their entirety, uh, require attention. So I agree. Uh, all right. I take it there's no other hand. All right. AG, let's go to all the honorable men. Uh, but I'm sure you'll cover the issues that have been raised if there's a need for a response. And then let's take the last presentation. Over to you, AG. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, again, appreciating and noting um, the comment from Honorable Trollash and Honorable Dex. Um, the question from Honorable uh, Mente, let's start with um, what, was the, what was the Treasury response? So uh, there were a couple of matters, I think there were about three or four matters that the, um, the NSF had, had disagreed with us on. And I think um, all of them Treasury clarified um, where we were coming from, again, the same principle that we have had. And on the matter of um, uh, the expenditure relating to the skills development, they also indicated to the NSF that uh, AGSA, what they are following, what AGSA is following is an audit process and therefore, you really cannot dictate from accounting perspective how the matter need to be audited. And I think the core of it, when we discussed with the NSF, in the main, they, they were saying that the audit team ought to accept the project manager's report. So the project managers would have um, supposedly went on the, on the ground at the projects and they'll compile a report. And they said that should actually also um, should serve as, as sufficient audit evidence. And, and we said, no, we said, look, no, I'm not necessarily appreciating that report and the work that they do. By the time the AGSA raised their hand and say, we can um, support what you reported, we ought to have seen some of these things ourselves. And I think to that extent, initially they were indicating the limit, the, the administrative burden that will come with them having that sort of pertinent information in their premises. And we said, we, we really never ask for the information and that pertinent a supported documentation to be in your premises. Be more than happy to go to the project, which is what we did. So we go to the project sites and we can get the evidence right there and then from the service provider. But what we found to be a challenge is that it becomes the responsibility of the AGSA with the service provider, which will not work because you would understand we don't have the mandate to access the service provider. So we ask NSF to say, if, if this process ought to work, the NSF must take a lead. So our teams cannot be left be dealing with the service provider on the ground. So you need to take responsibility so that when we walk out as well and we tell you that your service provider does not 
is not giving us that particular evidence, you also can um, appreciate where we're coming from. So one of the key responses and the commitment they've given to us is to say, in the current audit, so the audit for 1920, we agreed the audit outcome is it's appropriate from our side. We explained, we engaged them, and we explained that there is no audit report that gets recalled. It is appropriate and we finalize. We, however, said for the current financial year, as part of the commitment they also gave to us, that they will work on the project visits such that they are also able to support the auditors on the ground where their own officials take a lead in ensuring that the service provider is giving the evidence and if it so happened that that evidence is not there, from our side, we'll appreciate the fact that there wouldn't be an argument later on because right then and then, the official of the NSF should be able to appreciate what we are being given and what we're not being given. But I think in a nutshell, Honorable Mentor, there seems to be, um, at least from our side, from our assessment, that there is an appreciation and a commitment that they would ensure that they get that particular pertinent information with us going on, on sites again, like we've always been going, but not only going there by ourselves or with some of the people that may not be taking responsibility afterwards, but for NSF to also take accountability so that when we then draw the conclusions, there isn't somebody who feels we must go back again, because I guess we'll keep going back again and again. And at some point, we're going to have to, to cut it close. So that is the commitment we got, and we're hoping that uh, for this audit, we are busy now and we will be doing the project visits and we're hoping that it will give them a bit of mileage or at least even if it doesn't give them a bit of mileage, there are no disputes again in terms of whether the evidence is there or not um, because it remains the responsibility of the, of the fund to ensure that the money, if it's a stipend, it end up in the, in the hands of, of the learner and that's primarily what our audit was asking. Thank you so much, Honorable um, Chairperson. Um, if, if, if I get your indication that I can close NSF, I would then hand over to my colleague, um, Zoli Swazwagala, to then just take the committee through the, the CITA audit outcome, and that will be our last presentation as the AGSA for the day. Um, Chairperson, if I can just get your reaction. Yeah, no, that is in order. I think you can proceed in that fashion. Um, and then Thank if so there much. are any other follow-ups to all the presentations combined, we'll do that at the end. So you can proceed with the last presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Um, so Lisa, if you can take over, um, I believe Secretariat would have given you the presenting rights. Thank you. Thank you, indeed. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you to my colleague, uh, Kabo. Dufuno, my colleague, will be projecting. Uh, I think the screens have come up now, Chair. So mine is to, Chairperson is to present on a CETA. CETA is a entity within the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies under Minister and Abeni Abrams. So, uh, Chair, I will be covering the 1920 financial year and audit outcomes, uh, similar to my uh, colleagues here. So just as a, a reputation promised, uh, Chair, it's similar to my colleagues before me, really, ours is to strengthen our country's democracy as an office by enabling structures uh, such as you for oversight, accountability, and governance in the public sector. Um, and Chair, as I said, the purpose of the document really is to outline the outcomes of CETA for the last financial year, which was 1920. Um, and then Chair, if I jump onto item 1.3, where we remind the committee around the services that CETA provides, which amongst others include the network services that they provide to the rest of government, and uh, housing, hosting, uh, and cloud services, uh, services such as those, and as well, uh, part of their critical mandate being for them to be a procurement agency service for ICT goods and service in the public sector. So in terms of funding, we know that CETA is meant to be self-funded and financially sustainable on their own through the full spectrum of the ICT services that they render. They, we know that they've got uh, various SLAs that they have with the departments, with the entities and government uh, through which they then generate revenue, which is meant to sustain them for their operations. I think Jay, if I go to item 1.5 on your screen, uh, we are just throwing attention to a few 
uh, call them anomalies for CETA in the year under review, wherein CETA uh, did not have a board for the whole year under review. The previous board's term came to an end around December 2019, and it was then not renewed by the minister. Uh, then a person um, was appointed to fulfill uh, the, both the role of CEO of CETA and the board of directors. Um, he was given a general term of the executive caretaker because uh, CETA was then put under administration. Uh, all in all, um, to try to reconfigure and reposition CETA uh, to try to respond to, to many of the ills that had been called against them in the past and try to uh, re-energize and refocus the entity. So the executive caretaker chair was there, uh, appointed end of January 2020, uh, call it two months before the end of the financial year. And uh, he fulfilled both those roles, as I said, both CEO and the board. And just before, call it two weeks before end of the financial year, then an interim board of three people was appointed, uh, which uh, consisted of the executive caretaker, the acting chief financial officer at the time, and also an, uh, a DDG from the department. So we can see uh, quite a bit of instability there, uh, which showed, uh, I think, even in the outcomes chairperson and the oversight, uh, I think as my presentation goes, you will note that for period of the year, the audit committee was also not properly uh, constituted or was not there at all, uh, which is an important structure for monitoring financial uh, governance and uh, compliance per se. Then, Chair, if I jump to item number two, where we now show the audit opinion history for CETA, CETA regressed for the year under review 1920. For the years before that, they had been at least unqualified on the financial statements with some findings on compliance and predetermined objectives, but for the financial year under review, there was a regression in the sense that there were some uncorrected material misstatements on property plan and equipment, intangible assets, as well as uh, the completeness of irregular expenditure reporting. So, uh, Chair, I think as I go, I will I will unpack those a little bit more, the, the causes uh, for the regression there. But I think uh, when we come to compliance, then we'll see, as I mentioned, that there's been material misstatements in the submitted financial statements. Uh, we highlighted this even in the prior year. However, in this current year, there was, um, I think the, the issue was really too much for them and the time lim uh, limitations were also signed seat a bit late, by the way, Chair. Uh, uh, all in all, uh, responding to management's request and the executive caretaker quest to really try to remedy and arrest the situation there. Chair, if, I, if we go to section three, where we now uh, highlight the overview of the outcomes. So all in all in 3.1, we are highlighting that CETA indeed uh, overall regressed from a financially unqualified to a qualification and across three areas at that, which is assets, uh, intangible assets, as well as irregular expenditure. Uh, and then Chairperson, if I jump now to uh, section 3.3, uh, there were also some significant findings still persisting at CETA across supply chain management. As we said at the beginning, one of their key roles is to facilitate and be an agency for procurement of IT goods and services. Uh, however, CETA still continued to, um, uh, you know, incur quite a, a huge number of irregular expenditure still for the, for the year under review. As an entity themselves, they disclosed irregular expenditure of about a billion rand. Um, which points to the non-compliance with, the, with their SAM policy. However, even that process, the audit process, you know, highlighted more irregular expenditure that needed to be disclosed. And uh, uh, through that exercise, it was clear that all the irregular expenditure is still not uh, disclosed at CETA. And uh, due to the capacity and time constraints, then the exercise was not completed before the financial statements were, were submitted for auditing and the final audit report was, was, was issued. Chair, in 3.4, we highlight some of the critical IT controls that are still concerning at CETA. We know CETA deals heavily in IT. Uh, uh, so there were some weaknesses highlighted in IT governance, uh, structures themselves in IT controls, key IT controls themselves, 
uh, which still need attention, uh, a chairperson that we want to draw the attention of the committee uh, to, that they do need uh, quite an urgent um, intervention. And then, Chair, if I jump quickly to item number four now, where we unpack the, the qualification areas themselves. So on property plan and equipment, the real problem there is CETA complying with the relevant uh, financial reporting framework in terms of accounting for property plan and equipment, wherein you would find the useful lives and residual values that they use not being in accordance with uh, the relevant uh, GRAB standard. As well, you will find instances where and as, as an example, certain uh, similar assets bought around the same time. However, when they record them in the books, they will record them with different useful lives. And when you interrogate management around those, it, it would not be clear why they would allocate different useful lives for exactly the same asset bought uh, you know, at the same time. So there's a, a clear misalignment for us, Chair, between uh, finance and the lines of business at CETA in terms of accounting and keeping track of their assets. And I think as we can appreciate, their assets are quite uh, uh, specialized in certain instances and high value assets at that, and they need a very close eye. All, also, the impairment assessments, Chair, uh, for these assets, um, uh, highly specialized assets, IT assets at that, uh, when was not properly done. Uh, by CETA, by management, and, and some of the judgments and assumptions that they made could not really be substantiated. Also, we find certain, certain transactions or allocations uh, allocated to the asset value that we did not believe that they belonged there, that had to be reclassified and reallocated elsewhere. Intangible assets, Chairperson, it's similar to the asset uh, property plan and equipment uh, uh, you know, story in the sense that they're useful lives as well. Um, you know, we're not properly kept track of, including the residual values and also the impairment assessment that needs to be done. And Chairperson, if I can put it in layman's terms, if those are not properly tracked and, and aligned, then it means that the value that you disclose on the financial statements uh, cannot really be credible uh, in the sense that it does not align to the financial reporting framework that you say you are aligned to, and therefore certain key adjustments, material adjustments at that are necessary for you uh, to make. And in CITA's case, because of the sheer value and number of their assets and different sites across the country, then that exercise becomes quite a huge uh, task to go through. Irregular expenditure, we said, Chair, that the CITA themselves disclosed quite a huge number of irregular expenditure, and they were not able to then go back once the audit process reveals other instances to quantify and fully disclose the full extent of irregular expenditure so that it can be thoroughly investigated, interrogated, and where, uh, where applicable uh, write-offs or condemnation or recovery processes then commence in that, in that respect. Thanks, Chair. Then if I jump to item five, Chairperson, on predetermined objectives, I think this is the one glimmer of hope that we had at CETA for the year uh, we are looking at uh, in the sense that for this year, there were no findings for CETA on AOP or something that we applaud them for. There was uh, quite a, a, a good a discipline there around uh, making sure that targets were both useful and what they reported in the performance report was actually quite reliable without um, you know, many uh, adjustments coming as a result of the audit process. However, Chair, when it came to compliance with laws and regulations on section six, we said already 6.1, their financial statements contained many material financial uh, uh, material misstatements in, and therefore they were not prepared in accordance with the financial reporting framework. Chairperson, there was a, a quite a long list of those and I think when we took the audit committee through the new audit committee, they could appreciate where we were coming from to say, uh, you know, uh, the screws need to be tightened in the finance shop in terms of preparing financial statements that are credible outside of the audit process itself, unlike waiting for, for the auditors to highlight all these myriad of of misstatements that 
uh, you know, were able to be picked up. And I and I don't know, Chairperson, maybe the, the entity can relate the story or their circumstances themselves. Uh, there was a lot of, of, of acting uh, uh, roles at CETA. There was a lot of vacancies at CETA for the year under review. I also mentioned that the audit committee by the time the year end came was not there. Uh, the board, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, only stopped operating in December of 20. So there was a lot of instability in the entity itself. And uh, perhaps this area is one that clearly showed that uh, fact there. Chair, also 6.2, we are just reminding around the huge irregular expenditure that is still being incurred uh, at CETA. And I will open shortly uh, where some of those uh, irregular expenditure came from. So if I jump to uh, focus on 6.3.1 chair, there we are throwing the committee's attention to the fact that certain goods and services uh, below 500,000 were procured without obtaining the required price quotations. So this is something you know for us that requires a lot of discipline and compliance there too, because it is there for a reason to make sure that you, 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 you procure in a competitive and a transparent and a fair manner. So when we do not uh, source quotations or even source the required number of quotations when we procure, then it becomes a, a problem. We are also throwing attention another area that CETA, you know, uh, found themselves non-compliant to is the fact that certain contracts were awarded only to bidders who did not submit a, a declaration of whether they were employed by the state or connected to anyone that is employed by the state which is a requirement of Treasury Regulation 16A3. And in that respect, there was a non-compliance there. Also, in certain instances, quotes were awarded to bidders that did not score the highest points. And Chair, we can appreciate that, that uh, usually the, the bidder that scores the highest point is the one with the best price under the conditions. And if we do not do that, then it exposes the state to a spending maybe a bit more than they could have. Also, certain of their bid documentation did not stipulate the minimum thresholds that needed to be there for local content, which is a requirement of Regulation 8.2. Um, okay, also, I can mention that some of their invitations for competitive bidding were also not exposed or advertised for the required minimum uh, period or number of days as required by Treasury Regulation 16A63. Also, they awarded to certain suppliers that use tax matters had not been really declared to be in order by SARS as required also by the Treasury regulations. And also the extension of contracts chair was uh, approved or extended in certain instances without the approval of the properly delegated official. So for us, Chairperson, this area of supply chain needs a tightening of, of the screws and the disciplines there across all these matters because in our assessment, these are matters that are fully within the control of CETA. Uh, as an example, source all the documents and declarations you need before your award, uh, expose uh, bids for the required number of days as an example, make sure your local content uh, requirements are complied to when you issue your bid documentation, all of those things need attention at CETA. And then consequence management, Chairperson, also I, I had one of my colleagues before talking to this one, uh, we also found instances where you couldn't find uh, evidence that the appropriate disciplinary steps or consequence management was appropriately uh, instituted at CETA where there were uh, instances of non-compliance and transgressions being incurred uh, as an example for irregular expenditure. And then Chair, if we unpack the actual irregular expenditure itself, as I said, that it increased by at least a billion rand from the prior year. And when I talk about those numbers, Chair, we must keep in mind that I'm not sure if that number is, is the complete number due to the fact that I mentioned that they could not complete all the irregular expenditure, uh, opening their cupboards and making sure that everything that needed to be disclosed is disclosed, because only then can you do the next steps of investigating uh, recovery and the like. Uh, so those processes were still not tightened uh, by the time that the audit uh, concluded, Chair. Fruitless and wasteful, uh, it was incurred and increased also for the year under review, Chairperson, and we drawing attention there to an, uh, an amount of about three uh, billion there. 
uh, uh, 3 million rand representing maintenance and support payments made for a void, equi uh, a void equipment that was uh, not in use um, at CETA or by CETA. Chair, we also instituted uh, and implemented our expanded mandate at CETA. Uh, and in that sense, we went through all these uh, matters, the non-compliances that I went through. However, at this stage, we could not come up with material irregularities per se that we would say, uh, uh, look, this one meets all the all the checkboxes of the of the of the definition. And therefore, as an example, let's um, refer this to the SIU or public or, or, or whatever chairperson. So for now, only the irregular expenditure we could highlight and, and confirm for definite. However, we will keep uh, looking for material irregularities as we implement, continue to implement our expanded powers and mandate at CETA. So Chair, just to summarize then the, the picture for, for CETA, as, as, as you, you will see the legends there, where we highlight green, we're saying that you know the indicator is quite good. Where it's saying yellow, we're saying it's causing concern, and where it's red, we're saying that intervention is required. You will know, Chair, there's no areas that are, are currently good. Um, and, and I think the background that we've pointed may be talking to that. Uh, and also a lot of the areas are causing concern at CETA, including uh, effective um, oversight, uh, including the policies and procedures, which in a lot of uh, areas were not aligned to the new uh, business processes or business model that CETA wants to do. The action plans for audit Jefferson did not gain the traction that was needed to make sure that they, there might be an improvement for this year. IT governance, suffered quite a quite a bit uh, a chair and also the processing and reconciling controls are causing us concern in the sense that there was a lot of of errors in the financial statements that the, the entity submitted it may also have been due to the uh, covid pandemic that destabilized a lot of things i know management was was trying quite a bit however their financial statements were particularly not of good quality this year and chairperson where we say intervention is required is in HR management, all these acting positions and vacancies in ex co chair. I think there was a, a whole lot, I would say the majority of ex at some point was either an acting uh, person uh, or filled at it on a temporary ba basis. And also the fact that, uh, you know, there's still no formal permanent CEO it's still called it under administration under the, the executive caretaker is, is, is cognizant or indicative of that. Record keeping needs attention chair um, as well is highlighted uh, a, a rate there where we at times we, we had delays around, you know, the entity giving us the documents, particularly on STM uh, and, and uh, giving us the documents so that we can, we can order to those documents. And also a lot of documents at CETA are still very much paper-based. Uh, and uh, I think it would do them good if they, they could migrate to more um, current and technological sources of storing and archiving uh, data. Reporting, Jefferson, is an is a intervention is required. Compliance, as well as the audit committee, wherein we mentioned that for a period of the year, there was no audit committee at CETA. Um, Yes, I think I've summarized, I'm not going to go again through the, the verbiage under 9.1 uh, chair, as well as, 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 as 9.2, as well as 9.3. So chair, just to round off then, I think uh, it was an unusual year for, for, for the agency and uh, you know certain key interventions and oversight are required for, for CETA to arrest you know, some of these areas. And I think we highlighted them around uh, the vacancies that prevail. And um, uh, also extending to the board committees, which for us as audit committee, as, as auditors being the audit committee through which we, we, we connect, uh, chair the record keeping, the IT control weaknesses that still prevailed, co uh, monitoring compliance for your SCM and procurement, so all of these things prevailed, and um, as our recommendation to the committee is to uh, for the committee to request really regular feedback on the action plans and implementation thereof, and also uh, the, we recommend that the committee monitors 
um, you know that you know consequence management where applicable is then um, you know um, done and uh, taken care of there at CETA. Chair, I will, we will stop there and uh, take any questions there uh, based on our presentation. Thank you, Chair. All right, uh, colleagues, thank you very much uh, for the, the AG. Um, are there any hands? I don't see an indication in the group. I'm not sure. Uh, Honorable Somna, you may proceed. No, no, th thank you very much. I think, uh, you know, it's uh, all the reports that we have received have got uh, a, a line of distress. Um, you know, it, it only depended on how, how thick or twisting the line. Uh, on this one, it, it looks like there's a whole lot of a a collapse of governance, uh, administration, uh, uh, and administrative controls, because the intervention is uh, designed uh, to take any entity uh, uh, from 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 a state of disarray to some form of an orderly uh, functionary. In this instance, it was the other way around. Um, um, and, and, and turning it to my head is the fact that how, how would you expect uh, that an entity um, which has been designed this way, both uh, on administrative functionaries, executive, uh, as well on the board uh, in terms of governance, would uh, reliably uh, find a way uh, to act uh, when things fall apart, uh, because it's it's it it, it should, should define some form of an act uh, against those actors, which are necessarily are a common factor um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, both uh, the the practice uh, in as far as the uh, actual day to day activity is concerned. Uh, the CEO is tend to be the chairperson of the board. The CFO is part of the board. The DG is part of the board. And that board is designed to be absolutely uh, having um, a, a lack of a form of a, a basic or peri-independence, uh, quasi-independence in one way or the other. So, 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 uh, when, when I get this kind of a report, you'd, you'd get to see an entity in full in distress. I think uh, the comment by the uh, audit team is, is, is this that, let's take an example on the, on the IT, that, that this entity is designed to uh, basically assist government as a core function, uh, which is, which is a, on the IT aspect, but but themselves have, have got have got have got a, a, a you see a glaring weakness when it comes to um, that necessity, and 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 therefore, uh, in my language, you'd say email uh, You see, so the difficulty turns to uh, the owner of the entity, one way or the or the or the other. So, so, so I'm lamenting these uh, kinds of comments uh, showing the depth of the problem. And lastly, you'd look into the comments made by the AG when uh, they had to audit uh, the expenditure uh, on, on the, on the uh, COVID-19 intervention, where, where they would, in each and every area, they would have an indication that we need integrated systems, integrated systems, failure of integrated, whether looking to UIF, whether looking to SARS, whether, so every entity was uh, presenting the lack, lack of uh, lack of that. And therefore, if an entity charged for that responsibility is, a, is, is deep 
deep at its own slip uh, like this uh, and getting closer to a billion rand regular expenditure or even beyond, it means that we don't have an entity. Uh, that, that's, that's the line I draw uh, out of the uh, AG's uh, finding. I rest my case. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Samuel. I think you have covered all of us. Uh, colleagues, are there further hands? Going you down. are correct uh, to say, Honorable uh, Samuel, <laughs> covered all of us. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Colleagues, I, I, uh, I, let me take this opportunity and thank the AG team uh, this morning um, for what has been a very thorough briefing some very serious matters um, which we, we obviously have to um, you know engage on as a matter of agency um, and as colleagues have said we, we need to be very in detail it's, 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 it's fundamentally just depressed to to hear these things but also at the same time, I think it speaks to the very thorough work that the AG uh, has done uh, in actually unearthing these things and leaving no stone unturned, albeit sometimes very difficult uh, uh, circumstances. So I think we are empowered to proceed uh, for hearings uh, on these matters, and um, we, we will have to prioritize uh, all these issues. Um, so that um, they actually are dealt with and that we deal with them. And I think colleagues have been very frank today about the agency of the situation. So I want to thank the AG team this morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, and so may we, we will, we will liaise maybe in the coming days in terms of how we structure everything. Uh, and then we have the hearings into these matters. So colleagues, if we can leave it at that uh, and uh, prepare for the, there's a question session this afternoon uh, as well in the house. So I think uh, what has been a marathon really, it's been almost three hours. And um, so I think we, we've done well to do that. Meeting stands agenda. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.